right now we have an incredibly strong economic outlook. Certainly inflation is a concern, and I agree with that. The recession is at least a 50-50 bet, given how far the Fed's likely to go. It's just that the timing is pretty far down the road. The Fed does its thing. Sometimes it makes mistakes on the way, but generally it has pivoted successfully. Everybody's afraid that they're gonna get it wrong, and the chances are that they will get it wrong. The near-term pain, could be so severe that you just cannot look through it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keen and Lisa Abramowitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures positive by a little more than 1% on the S&P. TK, we are set for a seven straight week of losses. Yeah, somebody just said happy Friday to me and I growled at him, John. I think that's sort of the mood. That's uh, every that's morning. Out there. Isn't that every day? <laughs> yes. That's every day, but this Friday, what? What do we know? You know, we got green on the screen, John, but the correlations here, and to start with Jane Foley this morning is mint because foreign exchange is telling me there's still an immense amount of tension out there. TK, okay. there's so much to work through. Highlight of yeah. the week for you, what was it? Or rather the low light is going to be retail in America. The highlight of the week is it's over. It's, uh, it's, seriously, it's, it has been just incredible stress. The highlight for me, John, is how safe haven clicked in about Wednesday. First thing I do, I come in, I look at Euro Swissy 1.029, and that's different from a week ago. It's sort of been stronger Swissy, little bit, but there's a little bit of safe haven feel on the growth scale. I'll throw treasuries into that story too, yes, Tom. The Bramo yes. yields lower last week by about 20-odd basis points. This week as well, just grinding a little bit lower again. Particularly on the long end, what I find curious is any Fed speak that we've gotten this week has just confirmed that any weakening in the stock market it is by design. It is not a fault of their plan. They are looking to this to actually tighten financial conditions. So they're not going to come in. And yet people seem to be downgrading their expectations for the Fed because of how weak the economy looks with respect to the retail sales and a couple other data, data points. Lisa, it's a feature, not a bug. Exactly. It's an objective, a goal. We talked about Fed Speak of the Week last week. Have you got a Fed Speak of the Week this week? Yeah, Esther George of the Kansas City Fed. She came out yesterday and she basically said, this is by design. I mean, I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but basically confirmed confirming the same point. This is not a Fed ready to commit a Fed put. This is a Fed saying, great, that is how we execute tighter financial policy. At some point, they step back from all of this. I get it. But what we've got to work out, Lisa, is under what conditions? What do they want to see? What's the threshold for that to happen? And honestly, we keep going back to credit, right? Can companies finance themselves? A, they don't have to. B, to the extent that they are, you are seeing some cracks start to form, but nowhere near the levels of stress that we saw in other big disruptions in the market in prior years. Equities right now up 42 on the S&P. Let's whip through this price action for you. On the S&P 500, up by more than 1%. On the NASDAQ 100, up by 1.5%. Yields look a little something like this, high by a couple of basis points to 286. Chinese banks cutting rates. That, Lisa, seemed to put just a little bit of a floor under sentiment coming into the open this morning. People have been waiting for this. How much could the Chinese government stimulate the economy in the face of the slowing economic trajectory? And just to put this into perspective, Bloomberg Economics expects that the Chinese economy will lag behind the U.S. economy in terms of growth and GDP so far this year and through, 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 through the end for the first time going back to 1976. All right, let's talk about what we're looking at today. It's kind of a quiet day ahead of a weekend where everyone's going to be heading to Davos and trying to figure out how to uh, position for the week ahead. Deere is planning to report earnings, which I think will be really interesting in light of food prices climbing to the highest ever. And not only this, but people really needing to farm more. They are expecting record profits. How can we really see that at a time of shrinking <laughs> margins? Today, the G7 meetings wrap up in Germany. They are poised to agree on a $19 billion package of aid to Ukraine to keep the, comp uh, the country operating operational during this conflict. How much do they also talk about other fiscal support? I mean, honestly, at what point is Europe the leader in fiscal stimulus, which is so ironic considering all of the austerity pro programs of Europe over the past few decades. And today, President Biden heading to Seoul in South Korea. He is going to be touring the Samsung factory. I'm very curious, John, what they say about possibly shoring up some of the supply chains, also uh, chips. The other story that I don't think has been talked about enough this morning, Lisa, the potential for a meeting with the Saudi Crown Prince, Mohammed bin Salman, and the President of the United States, and reporting from Washington from our team suggesting that could happen 
at some point in the near term. And frankly, what is the political fallout from that? Right now, the U.S. needs more oil, not actually oil, as much as gasoline. How much are they going to turn to the Middle East to shore that up uh, versus try to uh, talk about domestic production? Looking forward to catching up with Anne-Marie about that story a little bit later this I agree. morning. That is important, TK. That is really important. Well, there's a backstory here for our international audience, John, and it folds into the death of the gentleman from the Washington Post, Mr. Khashoggi. So in Washington, this is a particularly sensitive uh, issue. I think it has a different tinge, a different tone in Washington than normal diplomatic discussion. AMH coming up in about 10 minutes' time. Joining us now is Jane Foley, the head of FX strategy at Rabobank. Jane, what a week. Let's start with this question. Are rate hikes from the ECB? from the Bank of England, is that currency positive or currency negative in this market regime? You know, this is what the market's trying to get to grips with. And, and this is really highlighted this week, particularly for the Bank of England and the data, because at the start of the week, we had a really tight labour market data. And, you know, that raised the question of, well, you know, is, is the labour market here more resilient to interest rate hikes? <laughs> Bear in mind, we've already had four consecutive hikes from the Bank of England, and yet the labour market is still tightening. And and so that uh, led, led some commentators to the view, well, look, the Bank of England is going to have to do more then in order to create that loosening in the economy to try and bring demand down. And yet now we have consumer confidence data this morning at its lowest levels, its weakest levels since around about 1974. And of course, that highlights the cost of living issues that we have, the cost of living crisis in the in the UK. And that again, and we've talked about this before, it's difficult perhaps to reconcile this really tight labour market, too much demand on one hand, with the fact that there is this cost of living crisis and many people are really feeling mm. the, the, the pain of, of higher energy and food prices. So what does the bank do? And, and that's what we've to try and conclude over the next uh, uh, next few months. Jane, you have been world class on avoiding FX hysteria. There's a modest hysteria over a repeat Plaza Accord, and those levels are out, depending on who you talk to, way, way out. Euro 90, week, week Euro, yen 135, 140, 150, week, week yen. Do you have any framework where those two currencies would weaken and the dollar would mega strengthen? Well, you know, the first thing I, I would say, I'd come back to, to, to Lisa's comments at the start of the, the program, the Fed is tightening interest rates. And that means equities are likely to go down as they have been, and the dollar is likely to go up. And and that's the reality of, of a central bank tightening liquidity in, into the, the crisis. So uh, I, I find it very difficult to to understand, you know, calls that, oh, the Fed or, or the, the, the central banks have got to get together and, and soften the dollar to, to help emerging markets, etc. It doesn't make sense to me. We're going to have a stronger dollar in an environment where the Fed is tightening interest rates. And when there's generally this risk of appeal, and that's related to First of all, maybe uh, fears about the U.S. economy next year, but also the possibility that Europe could be in recession if there is an oil embargo on Russia in Europe, and also this slowing China story, and that's really significant as as part of this risk-off environment. So I think the dollar is strong. Now, can the yen pick up what well, we've seen, some safe haven going back into the yen over the last week, Same, similar with the Swiss franc? That, I think, was on the back of better than expected current account data for Japan last week. So for two months in a row, we've had two current account surpluses. It had appeared for a while that with energy prices, with commodity prices so strong, that that would erode the ability of Japan to hold a current account surplus and, and therefore dampen the yen's uh, safe haven appeal. But that's coming back to, to some extent. But I still think the dollar is going to be king in this sort of environment. Well, but how much more can it continue to be even bigger king? In other words, how much of these gains basically been baked in at a time when the narrative that you basically just put out is basically the widely accepted one and you're starting to get more pushback from the likes of George Cerevelos reconfirming this morning his bullish call on the euro versus the dollar because this is all baked in and now the only surprises could really come to the positive side from Europe. I'm not so sure that that is the case. And, and to be honest, I think we could be having this conversation since December. In fact, I have been having this conversation to December. Oh, you know, all of the, the, the news is baked into the price of dollar. And, and at every turn, we've either get it, got a, a more hawkish Fed and, and then more recently, more negative news about the global economy. And, and that's why I think China is, is a large part of, of the answers uh, to this. So, for instance, we had more cases overnight of, of in, in Beijing of, of community spread of COVID. And that dashes the, 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 the trend 
end of the last four days that there were no community spreads. And that, of course, had been raising expectations about a loosening of restrictions. If we get more community spread, then, then that is going to dampen expectations about Chinese growth even more. And actually, our view for, for Europe is that there, there will be a recession at the end of this year or early next year. And that's because our house view now is that there will be a, an embargo on, on energy. And that means a recession for Europe is unavoidable. So I don't think that everything is yet baked into the price. I think China holds a lot of the problems. If, if, if growth there worsens, I think the dollar will firm on, on, on um, safe haven appeal. And, and also for Europe, I, I think that, that there, is, there are more risks for growth in that direction too. Jane, I've got to squeeze this in. Recession year end in Europe. Is that with rate hikes or without rate hikes? And if it's baked in, do they really want to be hiking into that? Well, you know, I think the reality is, is that the window of opportunity for interest rate hikes from the ECB is probably going to be very, very narrow. Um, the more and more people are in, in from the ECB have been talking about a J- July move. I think that's coming. Um, to a certain extent, I, I think there's some jawbone in there to try and, and prop up the value of, of the euro, because obviously yeah. a weaker euro is going to make the inflationary issues worse. So a little bit of jawbone in, a, a little bit of interest rate hiking. But I think by the end of the year, I think the, the growth conditions could be too poor for them, <clears throat> assuming, of course, that there is this embargo. And that, of course, uh, remains uh, up there. We haven't ha- had a decision for, on that yet. What a messy situation. Jane, thank you. Jane Foley there of Rabobank. Euro dollar just short of 106 at 105.94. I think the surprise of the week for a lot of people, what spooked many people, including Seema Shah of Principal Investors, who I caught up with yesterday, Tom, is that we thought this story was really well understood. We've been talking about it for months and months and months. Inflation, what it would mean for margins. And then Target came out. And you start to realise that even if something is talked about a lot, even if you believe that it's very well understood, it does not mean it's very well priced. Well, it's a pricing to it. It's the time continuum of it, John. And it's also the conflation of price analysis with real economy analysis. Target ran into the real economy. Equity futures right now at 44. It's a bounce back. We're up by more than one percentage point in the US. In the bond market, yields higher by three basis points on a 10-year, 286.77. Rounding out another volatile week from New York City. This is Bloomberg. you up to date with news from around the world with the first word on Rishka Gupta. Joe Biden is on his first presidential trip to Asia. The president will tour a semiconductor facility in South Korea today as he pushes to reduce reliance on China in the supply chain. Later on the trip, he'll meet with regional leaders in a bid to build support to counter security threats by China and North Korea. There's speculation that Kim Jong-un's regime may conduct its first nuclear test since 2017 whilst the president is in the region. More aid is on the way to Ukraine. Group of seven finance ministers meeting in Germany are set to agree on more than $19 billion for Ukraine to guarantee the short-term finances of its government. That's according to Germany's finance minister. Meanwhile, the U.S. Senate has passed an aid package for Ukraine worth more than $40 billion and sent it to President Biden for his signature. And the administration said it was providing Ukraine with another $100 million in military assistance. In China, banks have taken a step aimed at boosting the ailing economy. They cut a key interest rate for long term loans by a record amount. Lowering the five-year loan prime rate would reduce mortgage costs. It also may help counter weak loan demand caused by a property slump and those COVID lockdowns. Boeing and NASA have launched the long-delayed Starliner space capsule. The unmanned spacecraft is headed for a rendezvous with the International Space Station. It was Boeing's third launch attempt since 2019. The two failed attempts left Boeing perplexed, and it left SpaceX as the only American option for ferrying astronauts into space. Global News, 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. fundraising um, to secure the liquidity of the Ukraine government and it appears that there will be more than uh, 18 uh, billion uh, we can um, uh, raise uh, to support Ukraine in this uh, crucial historical moment.
That was Christian Linder, the German finance minister from New York City this morning. Good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Equities heading higher for now. Futures up by a little more than 1% on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, we're positive 1.5. Equities on the week down again for a seventh straight week. You've got to go all the way back to 2001 for a weekly losing streak as long as this one right now. Yields are higher by a couple of basis points. Let's call it three. 286.41 on a 10-year. Tom, the dollar's been weaker through much of this week. Euro dollar pushing 106 now, 105.92. It's fascinating, John, to see right now. John, what, what are your thoughts here on dollar? To me, that's the great research debate of the weekend. Starting to see some weakness creep in, Tom. And I wonder what's going to happen. My thoughts more broadly is on the other side of the pair. What happens with the euro? What happens with sterling? And we talked about this with Jane Folo of Rabobank, Jane Foley rather, just 10 minutes ago. A central bank rate hikes from the Bank of England and ECB, currency positive or currency negative? Which one is it if you think Europe's going into a recession? That's a difficult call. Yeah, when the finance minister's meeting right now, it's going to be interesting to see. And, of course, the ECB upon us right now. Joining us now, Anne-Marie uh, Horton joins us. And Maria Tadeo as well. Maria Tadeo and Bon Anne-Marie Horton holding court in Washington. I know, Anne-Marie, the president channeling BTS all the way over to Seoul, Korea. And he's looking for a permission to dance. There's no question about it with Northern Asia. What is the real ask that the president is doing besides meeting with the lads of BTS? Tom, for those that don't know who BTS is, by the way, we should note it's a K very famous K-pop uh, band, and they're actually quite good. They've gone pretty international, especially over the pandemic. But besides that, the president, I mean, his first step off the plane is a Samsung factory, and this Samsung factory is potentially going to be mirroring the one they're building in Texas, and he's going to make this a domestic story, saying this is what we need to be doing, shoring up our semiconductor supplies. The other big <laughs> obvious uh, moment of this trip, even if they don't talk about China directly, is that they're trying to have this new economic framework, something that could fill in for the TP which the Trump administration pulled America out of. The issue right now is, and Rahm Emanuel, the U.S. ambassador to Japan, actually said this to reporters, Asian governments don't really know what they're signing up for. Is it negotiations? Is it a framework yeah. just to start negotiations? But the point of it is to try to counter China and China's influence. And that's really the entire point of this trip. <laughs> Excuse me. Maria, today I look at this, and the president, of course, in Asia, everyone else is going to be up Happy Valley in Davos looking at, well, the history of it all. Klaus Schwab has talked about this moment in history as a theme of the World Economic Forum. I'm calling it Davos. It's over. I mean, the holiday from history is absolutely over. What do we do in Europe this weekend and next week to readjust the path forward with the war in Ukraine? Look, I think, Tom, we're not going to have to wake uh, or wait, excuse me, to tomorrow or the week after. It really is about today in this G7 because all the major central bankers, finance ministers are meeting as we speak. And what we know, and the German finance minister told us uh, this already, is that they are going to commit almost 18 billion uh, euros to help Ukraine. That was a big concern uh, going into this. I mean, this country could really face a situation where they don't have hard cash. They're not able uh, to pay things things on the short term. So the biggest issue was that the biggest obstacle was a short term funding for Ukraine. So clearly there's going to be a conversation. But today this is a done deal at the G7. I think the next stage and this is a much bigger issue is what happens with the war and the reconstruction of this country. That is definitely the long term picture. And also, you know, just how can you help uh, Ukraine win the war? I think that really is the long term conversation. In the meantime, we are seeing the real risk of gas supplies being and cut off from Russia actually come to fruition, especially as the deadline to pay in rubles does come up. And Maria, we are seeing Finland's importer Gasum Oy actually come out today and say that they're going to see Russian gas cut off. How much is Europe trying to get ahead of this? How much are we going to hear from other nations that similarly they are going to get cut off in the next few days? 
Well, I think in the case of Finland, this is a country that is very well diversified. I don't think this is going to be an issue for their economy on the medium, short term. Uh, they were ready for this, just like the Polish uh, were ready for this. They were expecting also the move in anticipation. I guess we have to really reiterate this. Russia is only doing this now because of that NATO membership that they've put on the table. Now, when it comes to the bigger buyers in Europe, and that is Italy, I spoke to the central banker uh, of Italy today. By the way, he mentioned this to the uncertainty around the energy and, of course, Germany. Germany. These are two countries that, for the time being, the Russians do not want to upset. They know it's a big buyer. They know anything they do in those two countries will have big political repercussions. But I think, yeah, they're ready for it. And they know that they have to prep that potentially yeah. this could happen. For the time being, however, we're seeing that companies are prepared to pay in rubles, which is not exactly what the European guidance said. But you see that the real money, the real business still prevails for the time being. And the real business, and marie perhaps prevailing as we see the White House working towards Toward the first meeting with Mohammed bin Salman of Saudi Arabia, as John was mentioning earlier. What's the thinking here, especially after, frankly, President Biden has called this man a pariah on the world stage and has expressed concern about human rights issues? Why is he now changing tone? Well, I reported along with Nick Wadhams and some of our colleagues in the region back in March that the administration, due to this war, higher oil prices, was starting to move away from that standoffish approach to Mohammed bin Salman. The president came into this administration saying he's going to deal with the king, counterpart to counterpart. But everyone knows the de facto leader, the man running the country every single day, is Mohammed bin Salman. <clears throat> and there's been talks for a while about a potential meeting, and now there's definitely more weight on it potentially happening. Have we reported, CNN reported, next month? And and this is going to be very delicate, how this becomes uh, public in the sense that is it just meeting, a meeting with Mohammed bin Salman? The Saudis run the GCC right now. Potentially, will other partners be there like Kuwait or Qatar? That might help in terms of some of the blowback the administration will perceive here in Washington, D.C., because the relationship between the kingdom and America was uh, deeply, it has been deeply fraught since the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. I remember it was the Biden administration that released that, uh, that report showing that this had <clears throat> the hands of Mohammed bin Salman on that killing, that CIA declassified report. So this is going to be a very tricky relationship. But the bottom line is, I mean, look where gasoline prices are today. Another record. I think it's $4.59. That's an average. We're not even at peak driving season. They are the only country that has spare capacity. America might have to engage with them at this point. MH, thank you to Maria as well. TK, that's the bottom line, isn't it? Things are getting tougher at home. Got to try and reconcile that with your goals abroad. And, and, and what's fascinating here is how we've forgotten the Pacific Rim as the president is to speak here in a bit. I mean, I look at it, John, and I just think the entire thing is dyna na 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 Okay. Na, na, na. Life is dynamite. Shining through Davos with a little funk and Keep soul. Keep going, buddy. Keep going. So I'm lighted up like dynamite. Whoa, oh, oh. Mm. BTS to meet with the president. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning. I can't promise you there won't be more singing, so sit tight. And maybe cover your ears. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Futures up by a little more than 1% on the S&P. And well, then the that NASDAQ by 1.6. Sounds really, really sad, Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Seven straight weeks of losses on the S&P 500. If we close that way, the longest weekly losing streak going all the way back 21 years, back <clears> to 2001. It has been that long. Your equity market bouncing today, but on the week still lower. If you get to the bond market, twos, tens and thirties, interesting that over the last couple of weeks, we've started to see bonds kick in the other way. Yield to lower. Yeah. Last week by about 21 basis points, this week by five or six. On a 10-year on the session, again, up on the day, but down on the week, Tom, by a couple of basis points, your 10-year, 285.87. John, two things, and seriously, how wacko it is right now. When you put that board up on radio, folks, handsome pharaohs sitting in front of a giant board, my eyes flip between the 10-year and the 30-year because I don't know where I am. I literally, the yield has been so whipsawed. I don't know which is but which. If you look at where the 30 year is right now, Tom. It's not far off where the 10 year's been exactly. this week already. Like three cups of coffee. And if you think a couple of Mondays ago, we were at 320 on yeah. tens and <clears> now close to 3.1% on 30. So the curve's still pretty flat if you look at it that yeah. way. If you look out further out into the commodity market, since early March, we're down about 9% 
on something like crude, down about 11% on something like copper. WTI 112. Copper's something I'm looking out for now yes. with China and their efforts starting to kick in. On the LME, we're up by three quarters of 1%. Crude gets my attention because I just think the idea that we could have a meeting between the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, and the President of the United States, off the back of our reporting, Tom, this morning, suggesting that could happen, I think that could be really, really important. Think about how long these OPEC meetings have lasted. 10 minutes, well, 11, 12, 13. They need to last longer, they need to do more, and that's what this president wants to see. In the history of this, John, back to 1986, and arguably the moment where OPEC collapsed and had to grow up out of their arrogance, is it all happened suddenly in oil. But I do take your point, John, to watch the industrial metals, and, and as well coal, off of a China reopening is front and center for June. TK, copper higher, crude just a little bit lower. It is a joy right now. Uh, on this Friday as we regroup again for meetings with someone who stopped us in Davos a couple years ago. Savita Subramanian was in Davos with her Bank of America holding court on ESG. She's head of U.S. equity and quantitative strategy for uh, the bank. Savita, time has marched on. ESG seems so yesterday's story, given record <laughs> coal prices as well. How does the shock of these many global risks fold over into moving forward in the stock market. How do you regroup now to get ready for 2023? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that where we are now is, Tom, a tough time for ESG investors because the best performing areas of the market are hard to hold. Defense, energy, these are two areas that are typically excluded from ESG funds. So I think that's been hurting these, uh, these types of investors. From a market perspective, I still think the worst is not behind us. Um, we published yesterday that you know, sort of a realistic worst case floor for the S&P 500 would be about 3,000, 3,200. Um, you know, here's the thing. I think when I talk to clients now, folks are asking me, you know, give me any reason to be bullish <laughs> right now. And I think the reasons to be bullish are the fact that clients are asking that question. There's a pervasive... Uh, kind of fog of negative sentiment out there, which would argue that a right. lot of the bad news is priced in. I think what you want to buy at this point in the cycle is still very late cycle inflation beneficiaries. So we're still overweight energy. I think energy, you know, to, to your point about China reopening, energy could be, oil could be depressed right now, just given the fact that the second largest economy in the world is offline. Um, I think that materials look less interesting to us, commodities and metals, because we are seeing some slowing trends in China, despite the fact that they are trying to, you know, stimulate the economy. And we're also seeing a shift in demand from finished hard goods and, you know, big ticket items to services. So under that backdrop, it makes sense to right. continue to go long oil, but, you know, maybe move off of the, the raw materials. Savita, long ago and far away, a guy named Ken Lewis was pilloried at Bank of America, and I always thought that Ken Lewis was brilliant on his Pacific Rim strategy. Bank of America didn't go into the Pacific Rim with their head cut off. They were very measured about it and attempted to be responsible. I want to know what you think about the bet on Pacific Rim equities given a China reopening. Is it worth playing, or do you stay in the U.S.? I think you stay in the U.S. I mean, look, I, you know, this this year we've seen a very interesting re-rating of countries based on energy security. Countries that can don't need to import oil are probably, you know, kind of enjoying a, a, a unique advantage. And and I think that second of all, the U.S. is further along in terms of trying to stimulate the economy, trying to push up interest rates. We have corporates and consumers that are better capitalized. They've, you know, basically gotten all this money from the Fed and the government. So I think that when I look at the U.S. relative to rest of world, I still think this is a year or two where the U.S. is going to continue to outperform rest of the world. So emerging markets to me still looks a little bit, uh, uh, you know, potentially risky. Not to mention that if you look at our economists, they're revising down their growth forecasts outside of the U.S. much more aggressively than within the U.S. So I think those are all reasons to stay local stay U.S. focused. Even small caps, I think, could do well in an environment where the U.S. economy 
is potentially, you know, going to see a little bit of a lift if companies start spending again. You know, Tom, I just want to say the most surprising thing to me during this earnings season is that even though all of these companies are guiding down and, you know, very negative in terms of what they're expecting over the next couple of years, they're still guiding up on CapEx. They're still telling us they're going to spend more than we think they're going to spend. CapEx cycles are generally good for the economy. They're good for small caps. Maybe they're negative for the companies that have to spend the money, but I think it's interesting to see that CapEx is still a theme that companies haven't dialed back. Savita, this week, staples have been absolutely hammered. Retail's really yes. struggled. You've been on top of that story. I want to understand from your perspective whether we're confusing two things right now, the difference between how much the consumer is spending and how they're spending it. There seemed to be a massive focus on just the weakness, the signal that you were getting from the retailers that there was some weakness out there. Do you think the biggest yep. story this week was just a shift in how they're spending, not how much they're spending? I so I think the big shifts were how they're spending and also just, you know, labor. There's a, there's a sort of a, a really dramatic shift in terms of undersupply to oversupply that we're hearing from companies. And that could actually benefit some of the um, more labor intensive areas of, of the uh, consumer sector, like supermarkets or, you know, we haven't seen these companies perform well, but I think that where we're, where we are seeing a little bit of an alleviation is in terms of the, the labor supply. So that's, you know, potentially a positive for margins. We're, we're overweight staples for the long haul because our idea is, as Ethan Harris, our global economist, continues to warn of rising recession risks, we think that staples, healthcare, no matter what, you still have to take your drugs and, you know, eat your food. So defensive sectors to us still make a lot of sense. In a stagflationary backdrop, the best performing sectors are energy, consumer staples, utilities, to a lesser extent materials. You want to stay defensive and you want to overweight sectors that benefit from inflation. Savita, you sound actually uh, somewhat pessimistic, and yet your outlook for the end of the year is incredibly optimistic at a 4,500 target. Yes, 3,200 might be the low case. Are you thinking of downgrading the 4,500 as the base case? And if not, how do we get there? Look, so, you know, our, our target is made up of, a, you know, a few different factors, one of which is our, our house view on interest rates. And I think that is the swing factor. If you look at this year, most of the big moves that we've seen have been accompanied by a move higher in either real rates or the equity risk premium. Our view is that real rates continue to move higher, but rates volatility kind of abates and we start to see, um, you know, PE multiples uh, essentially stabilize as rates volatility stabilizes. If that's not the case, we would be more negative. And I think that's the key factor to watch. Every tiny move in interest rates has an outsized impact on the S&P 500 in terms of, you know, its longer duration. And we've talked about this on the program. The sure. S&P 500 is now a 35-year zero coupon bond. It is super sensitive to the cost of capital. Savita, are you saying this is Ethan's fault or, or Mark's fault? <laughs> Whose fault is it? Both. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll let you I mean, run. I think they're both, they're both excellent. But, uh, of but course. yeah, we, we incorporate their <laughs> but, views. At she's going to get out of this. We're watching. <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> Dig that hole. No, we're done. We're done. Okay. So, Victor, thank you. Oh, so, Victor, Brian, appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, Brian. I right. know. So she's digging a hole, Brian. Of Bank of thank America. you so That's much. Good. They're all friends over there. Yes. Mark Cabana, Ethan they Harris, Savita. They are, Tom. They're all friends. I love that. 4,500 year end. Whose fault is it? Both. It's Mark's. It's Ethan's. <laughs> it's not mine. It's not mine. Tom, future's positive. A little more than 1%. John, it's serious stuff linking in the economics that we talk about every day to the market guess forward. And we got humility on that. It's always a guess forward. And I got to believe it's, it's, it's centered around, yeah, data dependency, but also expect the unexpected. What's the unexpected that's out there? I'm not sure what it is. I'm optimistic on China reopening. I have to admit, Tom, if you told me equities would be down for a seventh straight week, I'm not sure I would have said the staples, Lisa, would be lower by eight, nine percentage points on the week. But it's been that kind of week. It's been that kind of week as we realize that margin pressures are bigger than some people had expected, including the CEOs of the very companies that are experiencing them. How do we then parlay that into an outcome? 
outlook at a time when this might mean that they are not going to be raising prices on consumers as much or they can't. Or as uh, we heard yesterday, maybe this means that they're going to just accelerate those price increases. Savita touched on the big corporate story of the moment. The fact that we've gone from undersupplied to oversupplied, understaffed to overstaffed. Lisa, it's a story that you picked up on from Amazon to Walmart, then on to Target. And we're just seeing it all over the place now. Yeah, and is this compositional or is this something that is a wholesale retracement of the pandemic era economy? Futures on the S&P up by 1.1% from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden is in South Korea, the first stop of a trip to Asia where the focus will be on the economy and security. The president visited a Samsung semiconductor plant and made the case for passing legislation to improve domestic manufacturing and supply chains. In Japan, he'll meet with regional leaders. The president wants support for his plans to aid Ukraine and counter threats posed by China and North Korea. Meanwhile, Bloomberg's learned that President Biden is considering a meeting with Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman as soon as next month. That would mark a shift for the president. He has avoided contact with the crown prince over the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. By one account, the world has only 10 weeks' worth of wheat consumption in reserve. That is the lowest since the 2008 financial crisis. That's according to agriculture analysis firm Grow Intelligence. The firm's CEO, Sarah Menka, spoke to a UN Security Council meeting on food security. Other estimates aren't as dire. Still, high crop prices are putting millions at risk whilst grain supplies fall. And PIMCO and BlackRock are amongst the firms set to start debt talks with Sri Lanka soon. Bloomberg's learned that Alliance Bernstein, T. Rowe Price and Wellington are also amongst the members of a creditors group. Sri Lanka fell into default this week for the first time in its history. An economic meltdown has led to protests and a political crisis. SpaceX reportedly paid $250,000 to Cephalon employees claim that she was sexually harassed by Elon Musk. According to the online news site Insider, the rocket launch company made the payment to a flight attendant who worked as a contract employee on the SpaceX corporate jet. Musk, who's the founder and CEO of the company, calls the accusations utterly untrue. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. Thank you. Thank you. You're very generous. Thank you very much. Mr. President, thank you for that introduction. It's wonderful to be back in the Republic of Korea. President Yoon, I'm honored, I'm honored by the welcome you've given me to your beautiful country. And congratulations again on your election. Congratulations. <laughs> and recent inauguration. I and my country look forward to a very productive few days together where we can get to know one another better and explore ways to take the alliance between the Republic of Korea and the United States to an even greater heights than it already exists. And Vice Chairman Lee, thank you for welcoming us to this Samsung Semiconductor Facility. This is an auspicious start to my visit because it's emblematic of the future cooperation and innovation that our nations can and must build together. I'm joined by my Secretary of Commerce, Secretary Raimondo is here in the front row, who's working every day to bring us closer to that goal. I've just seen how this plant makes the most advanced semiconductor chips in the world. They're a wonder of innovation and design, precision, and manufacturing. Semiconductors power our economies and enable our modern lives, from our automobiles to our smartphones to medical diagnostic equipment. And when it comes to the most advanced chips, like the ones made here in Samsung, is only one of only three companies in the world that makes these chips. It's incredible, an incredible achievement. Because these little chips, only a few nanometers thick, are the key to propelling us into the next era of humanity's technological development. Artificial intelligence, quantum technologies, 5G, and so very much more, things we haven't even thought of at this point. This plant also reflects the close bonds 
and innovation between our countries. Much of the technology and machinery that is used to make these chips was designed and produced in the United States. And by uniting our skills and our technological know-how, it allows the production of chips that are critical to both our countries and are essential, essential sectors of our global economy. The President of the United and, uh, States there, he is alongside the President of South Korea at a campus owned by Samsung. Tom, the dependence on China, the dependence on chip production in certain parts of the world, a key, key issue for this tour of Asia for the President of the United States. You know, it's technology first. Samsung, it's three nanometers. And don't ask me what that means, John, other than Samsung's winning the game right now. And we would like them to win the game in the United States of America. John, this plant directly south of Seoul, a good distance. But what this trip is really about is unchanged is the distance from Seoul to the DMZ in the border. It's only about 46, 49 uh, miles is my recollection. In the uh, image for Radio John is a masked set of people behind him. And that's one of the backstories here is COVID is still front and center, including the new COVID north of the DMZ. Lisa, this particular trip runs through the weekend into Tuesday. I believe it also includes a trip to Japan over the weekend. Yeah, how much is he going to shore up some sort of idea, some sort of partnership ahead of China and the potential inv invasion of Taiwan. We did see some exercises to try to do some saber rattling ahead of that. And how much is the focus going to be on these semiconductors, especially given some of the shortages? Live from New York City this morning, good morning to you all. If you're just tuning in, equity futures are positive by more than 1% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq 100 up by 1.5. The earnings keep pouring through, Tom, the latest deer just moments ago. Uh, dear, with I thought some snazzy numbers. The stock lifts 4.2 percent, I believe, is the statistic. Uh, but, John, I thought it was a pretty good set of numbers spirited by nominal GDP. You go up 9 percent on one measurement of sales, and that's about right, given the, the inflation lift of uh, the top line GDP. All about the outlook here, TK. The stock's up by 4% in the pre-market. The yeah. outlook, they now see full year net 7 billion to 7.4 billion. They had previously seen 6.7 yeah. to 7.1. I believe the estimate was something in and around seven. So a little north for the outlook, Tom. That's decent news for that stock. All wrapped around the food shortage. Lisa Feach sharing that painful UN chart, uh, which is of international interest and emerging market interest. That brings us to Damien's Sassauer, it's been way too long since we've checked up with him. Chief Emerging, Emerging Markets Credit Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Uh, Damien, the dollar resiliency we're seeing is all focused on the big pairs, plaza, cord worry, and that kind of stuff. What does resilient dollar mean right now for EM? Well, I think you have to look at it through different lenses, Tom. I mean, you know, dollar strength is broad based. It's something that emerging market practitioners have learned to grow accustomed with. But if you're a true emerging market investor, it's all about your funding currency. And if you funded, for example, in Japanese yen this year, you find that the 20 major EM currency pairs are all positive on the year from a carry perspective. So, again, dollar strength is something that we've learned to contend with here in the emerging market space. It's about finding the right funding currency, yen, euro, whatever it may be in order to fund your, your positioning out, uh, abroad. As Biden heads to Asia, China announces additional rounds of trying to stimulate its economy, cutting that five-year loan rate uh, by the most on record. How much of a stimulative effect do you think that this will actually have on the region? Well, Beijing has welcomed President Biden with open arms by conducting military exercises in the South China Sea. I know. Is, you know. I mean, that's really where we are. I mean, look, the 15-bit cut in the five year is designed to kind of alleviate some of the stress on the mortgage sector. But the lockdowns are the big story there. You know, it's demand for loans. It's demand for lending, demand for credit in China, which is lagging. And so, you know, it doesn't matter how much stimulus you're going to inject into the system at this point. You have to kind of free up people. You have to get consumers out spending and you need to get labor out working. And that's really the issue in China right now. Damien, just a final one from me, the important work from home question. How many screens does Sasa have in the home office? Well, you know, I mean, look, it's a toxic brew back here behind me. I mean, we all know that. So, um, you know, I, you know no, look, I have two screens. You know, I think that's mandatory by Bloomberg. You have to have two flats. But, you know, for me, it's going to be about Rory McIlroy this weekend. Jonathan, I know you and I will both be watching. I mean, who's going to be watching the Red Sox? I mean, not many people. So Thank I mean, you. Does anyone Thank do that you. anymore, Tom? No, no. no they, well, last night was actually glorious. But, you know, John, what's really important here to understand is when Damien logs on in the morning, Quebec Hydro has to assist. New York State with their electricity pickup. <laughs>
<laughs> Damien, thank you, buddy. As always, Damien Sasser of Bloomberg Intelligence. Can we have his life? Can we just, you know, like... It feels pretty laid back, doesn't it? Can Golf on like, a weekend, a lot of sport. You know, a little toxic group. He's got that backdrop at the PGA. He's out at the PGA, and, you know, he's got You've the been watching the golf, Tom? Uh, I, 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 I watch it for a little, but I just can't That's no. sit there. I it, just, do you know what, Tom? It breaks my heart to see Tiger struggle. I yes. just hate to see yes. it. I hate to see it. Yep. It's almost painful. I it, don't like it, watching it. Actually, it was dinner conversation last night, and, like, I don't know what you do, John. I, it's outside my... First few holes, I mean, Tommy did really well. He's so, so talented yeah. still. You can see yeah. it, but it's just the body just doesn't seem to be there right now. Well, these guys are very visible. They, they, whatever the sport, they run out of steam. I mean, you know, it's sort of like Blackpink. When Blackpink is singing, singing, you know, they get fragile. They what, run what out. What is that? What is that? Blackpink is, you know, they, they're, they're like they, these girls are really doing it in Korea, and is this K-pop they're again? not BTS. Okay, can you give us a idea of a song by who? No, I'd like to do a Blackpink lyrics, but I, if I did them, I did, you know, on radio, okay. I'd be in trouble. Right now, we have an incredibly strong economic outlook. Certainly, inflation is a concern, and I agree with that. A recession is at least a 50-50 bet, given how far the Fed's likely to go. It's just that the timing is pretty far down the road. The Fed does its thing. Sometimes it makes mistakes on the way, but generally, it has pivoted successfully. Everybody's afraid that they're going to get it wrong, and the chances are that they will get it wrong. The near-term pain could be so severe that you just cannot look through it. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Abramovitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures up by 1% on the S&P. TK heading for the longest weekly losing streak going back 21 years. That was maybe the gloomiest open, John, we've ever had in the history of the show. I mean, it is Toxic Brew Friday. There's no other way uh, to put it. John, the emotion that's out there right now. I saw a, a, a a banner headline on another a network, not a financial network. And the gloom out there, John, is great. John, can I note the VIX is 28.70. We're not even at a sweat level, let alone a gloom level. A Bank of America say this, Tom, just moments ago, true capitulation equals Fed capitulation and systemic event well and unemployment rate rise yeah. is required first. Hartnett goes on to say, Tom, the bottom tactical line is the tape is very vulnerable to a bear market rally, but we would still argue sell any rips. And that's what's happened here. Over the last 10 years, it's been about buying the dips. This market more recently has been about selling the yeah, rips. Really, really well said. But, John, what I would add to that that I think is so important is along that continuum of the summer, and particularly after Target and what we saw at Kohl's and the others, John, these corporations, including airlines booming, are going to adapt at light speed. What a tough week for the retailers. And, Tom, I'm pleased you brought up the airlines because, Lisa, if you just had the airlines this week and we heard from them, they tell you consumer demand was great, price tolerance was high, but then you hear from the retailers and they tell you something else. Yeah, honestly, this has been the issue is that right now we are looking at a tale of many different industries. How much is this? And we keep harping on this, but this is really the big question emerging from the week. How much are we seeing a massive compositional shift from both uh, from uh, from goods to services that really is not anything in the in the history books just simply because of the pandemic? And how much is this a real deceleration in spending momentum? Is it a Wall Street problem or is it a problem for the broader economy? I think is what you're trying to ask here, Lisa. And it's really, really important because what we're seeing from the C-suite is them just struggle to find the right balance. You have gone on and on about this over the last few weeks. They've gone from understaffed to overstaffed, undersupplied to oversupplied in a blink of an eye. And some of these corporations are set up for the demand of 2021. In 2022, it's a different story. Okay, so I keep going back to what Stephen Stanley of Amherst Pierpont said. He was talking about how we look at this as a glass half empty, right? That basically the companies are uh, seeing their margins shrink, which suggests that they cannot pass along the price increases to the consumer. It could be the other way around, right? I mean, they could be ready to actually jack prices up that much more. This is the big question. Can they? We don't know. That is inconclusive. Do we really see evidence that they cannot pass along those higher prices to consumers? Or is this an issue of a precursor to even more inflation? A glass half full, glass half empty. What did we say earlier this week, Tom? Someone said to us they're struggling to find the liquid in the glass. <laughs> 
through much yeah. of this week. Yeah. That's what the feel has been like. That's the Tang theory. John, to me, the statistic of the week, and you're living it with your family in the United Kingdom, is 9%. I mean, I'm sorry, 9%. I have never said this in the modern era, John. How close are we to double-digit inflation? Tom, nine's not the story. Here it is. It's not over. It's not the yeah. worst of it. Yeah. It's not like the United States where you can say the peak year-over-year -year figure might be in. In the UK, they don't think it is. In Europe, they don't think it is. It could get worse before it gets better. Futures right now are more than 1% on the S&P 500, on the Nasdaq up by 1.4. Yields on a 10-year look like this, up a couple of basis points, the 286 on a 10-year. In the FX market, euro dollar 105.77, euro dollar up by, down by a tenth of 1%. Crude firmer by two tenths of 1%. WTI 112.45. Let's get to Michael Collins, Senior Portfolio Manager at PGM Fixed Income. Mike, I want to start with this week and how gloomy it's been. Have you found the same? You know, it's really funny, Jonathan. I was thinking the exact same thing um, yesterday. I, I had an old rule of thumb that's worked uh, several times throughout my career. When every single headline is negative, it's time to buy, right? And, and to your point, I mean, this morning, every headline, except maybe the Chinese rate cut, is negative, right? I think the pessimism out there is really remarkable. It's really widespread, and typically, uh, that's what sets up buying opportunities. Uh, Michael Collins, critically here in the IG space, a corporate space. I love your paragraph on that. It's a stochastic moment. You have to catch the falling knife to pick up price, going for higher price, lower yield. How do you determine when to load up on a beleaguered IG? Yeah, I mean, we, we actually cut credit risk uh, last year quite a bit because valuations uh, were tight, right? Spreads were, were too tight. And this year, we cut credit risk even more because we thought the tail risks were really elevated. And now, uh, a lot of those tail risks, the recession risk, which I think is a foregone conclusion, uh, is, is really baked in and it's starting to get almost fully priced in. And what you do, you look at credit spreads, right, Tom? So investment grade corporate bond spreads were at 80 basis points over treasuries. That was really full. They've almost doubled, right? They've gotten to that 150 territory, which historically is pricing in a pretty high probability of recession and certainly starts to flash value to us. You get into 160, 70, 80, you're supposed to buy aggressively. And the high yield market, I would say, has similar uh, trends. Mike, I remember a couple of months ago when you were saying buy the dip that you're seeing in bonds. And then you retraced that a little bit. You said, wait a second, we actually don't really know because this is a new circumstance. Where are you on that, given the fact that there is an inconclusive view on how determined the Fed really is to go at this hard and commit to that path that's currently is being priced in? Yeah, that, that's exactly right. So I've just talked about the, the credit side, and even that's not that conclusive, right? I mean, there are opportunities emerging. There are a lot of cheap bonds to buy, uh, but it's not time to get all in yet into credit. We're just starting to, to uh, add here, looking for opportunities. On the rate side, Lisa, uh, you're exactly right. I mean, 3% kind of across the curve feels uh, like good value, feels like probably a high watermark. And I think in three years from now, you'll look back and say, wow, I wish I owned more bonds at a 3% yield. But man, in the next you know, several quarters, could the Fed uh, continue to lean even more hawkish? And that 3% funds rate that's priced in, could that move to three and a half or four? I mean, talk about inflation in the UK. Inflation in some places are, is continuing to, to accelerate here. I don't think we felt the full implications of the supply shortages in Russia and Ukraine and the, and the shutdowns and lockdowns in China are still going to work their way through the system. So you're going to have more supply imbalances. And I, I do worry that there's a risk in the near term uh, that that funds rate that's priced in goes higher. And that could move yields a little bit higher as well. So we are neutral on duration right now. So, how, yeah, that's where exactly where I was going to go with this. How do you really, uh, really engage with this market with that kind of band of uncertainty? What does it mean to be neutral? How do you then stay fully invested? Or do you just go to cash and wait for some trigger to, to reemerge? Yeah, so when, when we're neutral, right, it's simple. You have a benchmark that has a duration of five, you're at five. You have a benchmark that has a duration of 15, you're at 15, right? So we're really... Uh, making sure that our, our, our clients who, who, who define their, their, their duration profile based on their, their liabilities and, and needs, um, that that is met, right? Um, so getting long duration right. means that we actually think rates are going to come down or at least they're, they're under, you know, they're, they're cheap. Right. And I actually think, again, over the long term, you're supposed to be covering that. If you're short duration, this is a good time to add. Michael, I want you to speak to people who aren't sophisticates. They're not buying the spread market. They're buying a managed product 
And on price, their South and bonds has never been seen in modern history. They're down three years coupon or however you want to measure it. How do they claw back? How do they reposition in fixed income to begin to make up the horrific damage? You, you start adding fixed income now, uh, um, you know, uh, there's no doubt about it. I mean, the yields on a lot of these portfolios we manage, even higher quality ones, have five handles on them now, right? High yield yields are in the upper single digits. And, and you're, the bond math starts to become really compelling when you're starting with these mid single digit coupons, right? Even if rates go up another 100 basis points in the next 12 months from three to four, Right. Your downside in this kind of portfolio is like you lose a percent or so. Right. If rates fall 100 basis points over the next 12 months, you can make low teens. Right. So, I mean, you're, the math, the bond math, the upside downside starts becoming really compelling, um, Tom, at these higher levels of, of coupon, higher levels of yield. And I think the forward looking returns are really attractive in fixed income. And Mike, earlier this week, Tom said the stocks guys were smarter than the bond guys. What would you like to say back to that? Yeah, the, the bond market is the center of the universe. We all know that, right? And, and, <laughs> That's right. And, 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 and the bond market is, is leading the way here. I just love how he said that with such a straight face there. Like it was a serious one. Mike, thank you, buddy. That was perfect. Seriously, Mike what, Michael, Peter. what he just did there was really important because it describes what's called a non-Gaussian log normal distribution. It's called a slapdown. At this point, John, what that means <laughs> is the return is wildly asymmetric. Yeah, you can lose on the downside, price down, yield up, but it is a double-digit home run trade. If you get it right, price up, yield down, that's log normal. Elisa is the center of our universe as well. Bramo, <laughs> we talked for a while, didn't we, when you would start to back up, when would P. Jim start buying? I think yeah. we got the answer. Yeah, exactly. Maybe. I don't know. We're, I mean, honestly, this sort of interesting uh, take of basically such a wide band of uncertainty that you got to stay neutral. Maybe if you're underweight duration, you can add back in. But right now, it is so hard to call what the Fed is going to do. And frankly, the ramifications longer term <clears throat> are pretty substantial. I mean, let's say the Fed backs away. Sure. How much does the long end get completely uncontrolled if you really see the inflation that a lot of people are talking about in the economy? The Fed back Backing away is not a call. The Fed's going to back yeah. away. That's inevitable at some point. It's the threshold, the conditions that we need to see, which push the Fed to back away. That's the big call, isn't it, Lisa? And I think that's a much, much harder thing to say. Right now, why would they back away? I mean, they haven't even started to reduce their balance sheet. Yesterday at 4.30 p.m., I looked at their balance sheet total. Of course you did. And it's actually been increasing over the past three weeks, just to give you a sense, marginally. But still, I mean, this is we're talking about tightening. No liquid in the glass. There's plenty of liquid still in the glass. QT starts in a couple of weeks. Right. Do you know what Lisa asked me? What did she say? She asked me if they play Oscar Peterson at the piano bar. And I just, I didn't. I know exactly what you're focused on. I, I just didn't know what to say. Your pub crawl next week. <laughs> yeah. Yes. It's more like That's Neil nice. Diamond's Sweet I know, Caroline. I know exactly what, what you're you want me to on. sing that, John? Please go on. Oh, please. You know, you've got it's some time. It's a very Red for Sox it. thing. Don't tease us. Well, K-pop, they're doing it. Blackpink's going to do it. Sweet Caroline. Okay. Whoa, whoa, nice. whoa. Nice. Stocks up. What Kill happens with stocks are down? What song have you got? Not, I don't know. No? You, you have a think. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. Joe Biden is on his first presidential trip to Asia. The president toured a Samsung semiconductor facility in South Korea today as he pushes to reduce reliance on China in the supply chain. Later on the trip, he'll meet with regional leaders in a bid to build support to counter security threats by China and North Korea. There's speculation that Kim Jong-un's regime may conduct its first nuclear test since 2017 whilst the president is in the region. A more aid is on the way to Ukraine. Group of seven finance ministers meeting in Germany are set to agree on more than $19 billion for Ukraine to guarantee the short-term finances of its government. That's according to Germany's finance minister. Meanwhile, the U.S. has said it has passed an aid package for Ukraine worth more than $40 billion and have sent it to President Biden for his signature. And the administration said it was providing Ukraine with another $100 million in military assistance. Finland is becoming the third European country to be cut off from Russia's natural gas. Like Poland and Bulgaria, Finland is refusing to pay for fuel in rubles. The lost supplies will probably have a limited impact on the Finnish economy. Russian gas accounts for just about 5% of the country's energy mix. 
And in China, banks have taken a step aimed at boosting the ailing economy. They cut a key interest rate for long-term loans by a record amount. Lowering the five-year loan prime rate would reduce mortgage costs. It also may help counter weak loan demand caused by a property slump and COVID lockdowns. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg. week. Bloomberg is live from the World Economic Forum annual meeting in Davos. Against the backdrop of war, climate crises, economic upheaval, and a global pandemic, our all-star team is there, reporting on the solutions being discussed by more than 2,000 leaders and experts from around the world. Coverage starts May 22nd on Bloomberg Television and Radio. The global semiconductor shortage has caused a shortfall in consumer goods, especially automobiles, and is contributing to higher prices around the world. And now, Putin's brutal and unprovoked war in Ukraine has further spotlighted the need to secure our critical supply chains so that our economy, our economic, and our national security are not dependent on countries that don't share our values. The President of the United States just moments ago speaking in South Korea. His tour of Asia begins this morning. Futures are positive by a little more than 1% on the S&P 500. On the Nasdaq, we're up by 1.4%. Yields are higher by about a basis point in a 10-year term, 285.14. Market's really on the move here, and a little nice improvement. Again, the VIX, 28.70. Right now, Emery Horton in Washington, and Maria Tadeo in Bonn, Germany. And Maria, I have to go to you on not breaking news, but a story that has stumbled out over the last four or five hours. Thank you, Ian Bremmer, for bringing this to my attention. We hope to see Dr. Bremmer in Davos. Maria, this is not just about Gerhard Schroeder with perks taken away. And finally, uh, 15 minutes ago, resigning from Rosneft. But it's also about Matthias Warnig. These two are joined at the hip with Nord Stream. Warnig was a uh, perhaps an acquaintance through the Stasi of Mr. Putin working for uh, the, the Russians at a time. Maria, just brief our international audience on what a mess this is for Germany. Well, Tom, is the real-time implosion of 25 years of Russia policy when it comes to Germany. This is something that for the German establishment was an embarrassment. We knew that it was going to happen at one point, and now today, of course, we see that the former chancellor is trying to break away uh, those ties with Russia. Of course, for many, the damage, the credibility, particularly when it comes to the Eastern European countries, the damage has been done, but this was a long time coming now. He's making it official, and for for the German government today, which, by the way, is the host country of the G7. I'm in. This is going to right. be a relief. At this point, it was proven to be not just uncomfortable, but incredibly embarrassing and also a symbol of this failed policy that is Russia when it comes to Germany. What does it mean for the political quagmire that is Germany? Is Scholz history, Maria? <laughs> Same party. Well, it's complicated to say because this goes all the way back to the SPD, but it's not just the German socialists, Tom. The issue here is that the problem is not just uh, the SPD, the socialists, Angela Merkel, the CDU. It's almost the entire political and business system of this country that had become incredibly connected uh, for Russia. You could say there's many reasons for it. You could argue it's a lot of this is war guilt. The Germans did feel a lot of horrible things happened in that great war with Russia. They wanted to make amends. You could go to to the recent history. This country was separated, divided in two, a part of this very connected to the Soviet Union, but also the money. Tom, you have to think that Germany is a very energy uh, reliant industry that for made in Germany with cheap Russian energy, they were making a killing. This was good business for a lot of people. The combination of all of this now is coming, however, to bite with the situation in Ukraine. It's becoming unsustainable for the German government. Meanwhile, Anne-Marie, how much are we out of the frying pan and into the fire when it comes to some of the alliances that are being drawn up to try to shore up oil and gas supplies? And I'm not just talking about Europe, but also with the United States. 
Well, when it comes to oil supplies, we still have Russia delivering oil to China. I believe there's a story out this morning on the Bloomberg terminal that more than $6 billion worth of crude the Chinese are buying up from Russia. And then, of course, India, which is an ally of the United States, which the president will be sitting down with as part of the Quad in Tokyo. These two countries are still buying Russian oil. At the same time, the rest of the world has really been shunning it. But it's a difficult line for the administration to walk because while they do want constant penalties against the Kremlin, it is hard for them to want to see all of Russian oil come off the market, even if they don't say it, because higher uh, oil prices means that it's just going to trickle down to even higher gasoline prices for consumers. And clearly, it is so obvious their biggest domestic challenge is inflation, the grocery prices, gasoline pump, and the likes. Meanwhile, Anne-Marie, we're hearing about this meeting with possibly uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia with President Biden to shore up more oil supplies. We're hearing from the Republican side, why don't you do more to produce more on the domestic side? This isn't really an oil story, though. This is a refined goods story. This is a gasoline story. Can you bridge that gap for us in terms of what really that can do, even if they get more oil and bring the price of crude much lower? It's a nuance that no one in Washington is talking about, and Javier Blas put it very succinctly yesterday. When you look at spare capacity in crude oil, that goes down to the kingdom, right? Saudi Arabia has it. They're the ones that can pump more. But when you look at spare capacity in refined products, that is China. China is the only one that has that capacity to turn that crude, or more capacity, turn that crude into the products we use every day. Jet fuel if you're taking a plane, filling up your gasoline pump, a diesel if you're driving a truck. So this is the issue the market has right now, that even if there was more oil barrels to come on the market, it's going to be very difficult to have the refining capacity to turn into actual products. And that is a nuance that no one in Washington, D.C. is talking about. It is just too nuanced into the oil market for people to get a grasp of. It's either, do we have the gasoline and oil or do we not? AMH is also very difficult at the moment to try and reconcile what they're doing on the foreign policy front with their domestic goals. And that's been the story now for about 12 months, hasn't it? Yeah, it is difficult. The president speaking to it just at the start of this program. You guys ran a little bit of a clip with him in Seoul touching down, touring a Samsung facility. Part of this Samsung tour and what he's going to try to bring in the foreign policy, what he calls it, of American middle class. So when he's there at Samsung looking at their mega facility for chip manufacturing and semiconductors, he's going to talk about the one that they're trying to build in Texas. And he's going to point the finger at Congress that for months has still been dragging its feet. They're now in a conference between members of the House and the Senate to try to come to an agreement for this broad-based package on a China a competition bill, and it has more than $50 billion for semiconductors. And the president was pretty direct with Congress, saying, quote, pass the damn bill, and that's going to be part of his foreign policy. But it's a tricky moment for them right now, both foreign policy and domestic and how the two intertwine. It's uncomfortable. Anne-Marie, thank you. AMH down in D.C. Maria, thank you to you as well. The president's first trip to Asia as president president continues through Tuesday. He'll go to Japan, Tom, later this weekend. It's fascinating, John, and the heart of the matter, as Ambassador Hormans told us yesterday, is the collapse of TPP by the Democrats, by the Republicans. He's trying to pick up the pieces, plus deal with the new China at the same time. And of course, Tom, as you know, TPP has a massive branding issue now for this president in this White House. But ultimately, the strategic goals of it, TK, I think they still stick, they still hold. Yeah, they've gone around past Singapore, past Malaysia, over to India, and it's Indo-Pacific. That's something a bit new. Futures on the S&P up about 1%, on the Nasdaq 100 up by 1.34%, a brutal year so far. A man who's a little bit more constructive than most, Jonathan Gollop of Credit Suisse. He joins us very shortly on this program. For our audience worldwide, heard on radio, seen on TV, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. The latest note out of Bank of America and Mr. Michael Hartnett. 
he would sell any rips, even though he acknowledges this market is very, very vulnerable to a bear market rally. Futures are positive by about 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq by 1.36 on the week. We're heading south again. Seven straight weeks of losses. We keep going over this. The longest weekly losing streak going all the way back to 2001. Something has changed, though, in the bond market. We'll do that briefly. Equities and bonds, the inverse correlation, it sticks again this week. It happened last week. Yields were lower on a 10-year by about 21 basis points. The lower this week as well by five or six on a session though we head higher by two or three to 286.41 that's your 10 year your two year right now up a couple of basis points as well 262 <laughs> yeah. 65 yields with just a little bit of a lift that's your cross asset price action let's get you some movers we can check in with remain bostic for more good morning remain hey good morning john we talk about some of those tech stocks and investor sentiment out there the good news is that some of those tech stocks are getting bid today some of them on the back of fundamentals including palo alto networks those shares higher by more than 12 percent here in the pre-market after a beaten raised quarter. And then you have Apple higher by about 1.5% pre-market here. No real reason other than maybe just buying into those dips here. But a little bit of caution here, even with that 1.5% rise here in the pre-market, Apple setting up for what's going to be its eighth straight weekly decline, a streak that we haven't seen going back to 2018 here. Dan Ives out here kind of defending the position here, not only reiterating his outperform rating, but kind of making the case here that a lot of babies are being thrown out with the bathwater. Unfortunately, I'm not really sure that matters right now. Investors said really is driving this market and it remains dour despite some of the green you see on your screen. Deer is sort of emblematic of that. Those shares down 4% here in the pre-market despite a beaten raise quarter. Uh, just a few minutes ago here. Those shares right now camped out at around 348. I would keep an eye on names like that and keep an eye on the retailers, of course, which have been all over the map all week long. Ross stores did come out with their earnings. Same issues mm -hmm. that we've heard with Walmart, Target, and some of the other big retailers out there. Uh, they're actually seeing pretty decent foot traffic, but the inflationary pressures are just too much. Ross stores shares down 27%. They talked a lot about actually raising prices in the most recent quarter, but basically admitted they weren't able to raise them enough, primarily because, well, they're a low price retailer and there's only so much you can do so much you can pass on to the consumer Burlington stores down about 10 percent which also competes in that same space also seeing pressure on Kohl's TGX and a few other names that are sort of at the bottom rung if you will of that retail spectrum all told what you're looking at on your screen here right now with regards to the retail stocks that's really driving sentiment right now and I would keep an eye on them as we get deeper into the day Tom. Romain Bostic thank yeah. you so much of course wrapping up the week the close look for that Friday afternoon that's on after the real yield We'll be looking for that uh, as well. Right now, and this is critically important with 2020 hindsight, to look back at somebody who nailed the last great moment of the bull market. John Golub and Credit Suisse had the courage to come out with a barbell strategy, which was blah, 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 and don't give up on the big techs. He was a genius. The genius joins us this morning. John Golub is head of U.S. equity strategy and quantitative research for credit at Suisse. Now what, John? I, you know, if I, if I have Amazon, Apple, whatever, and I'm going to hold them, what is the prescription to recover? You know, Tom, we actually think that in a high inflation environment, that tech just doesn't do as well. So it's interesting. We, we've been table pounding on tech throughout the last couple of years. But as we rolled into this year, we didn't say short them. We said basically go to neutral because as long as the cycle continues to be inflationary, they just struggle a little bit more. And what we actually see, and, and we've done a whole bunch of quant work around this, is that when inflation is high and stubbornly high, you actually want to be in stuff that's more cyclical, beneficiaries of this. So energy stocks, material <laughs> stocks, and the like. Not because these are the best stocks forever, but they're the best stocks for the moment. Will those tech stocks continue to have revenue growth? Um, yeah, but if you take a look like in the last, let's say the most recent earnings season, tech names um, you know, grew about 7%, but those cyclical groups grew something like 30 or 40% because they just, they just did better. They have more operating leverage, more physical infrastructure in, in, in the kind of old economy cyclicals, and therefore they have more upside. And if you look at this earnings season, those tech companies were, you know, the, well, the mega cap tech companies were pretty lackluster. So it's not just a sentiment issue. They're, they're having a harder time, but, but also they went into the year very expensive. That run that we were predicting in tech played out beautifully. And sometimes you have to know when it's time to take your foot off the pedal which is what we did on tech earlier this year. How do retail earnings fit into your thesis? 
Well, you know, um, Lisa, the I think that everybody starting really last Friday thought that the worst was behind us. And then with, you know, Walmart and Target news, people felt like they got kicked in the stomach that maybe the consumer is rolling over and companies are going to have margin problems. And then if you actually look, you know, we had a lot of companies like, you know, TJ Maxx and Home Depot and Lowe's, and they did fine. They, they had beats in the high single digits. It was really um, a couple of these prominent names like Home Depot and Lowe's at a harder time. And a lot of those were really what I would call is a mix issue. People were buying groceries, but they didn't want to buy furniture and TV sets. And, and in many cases, these were really merchandising problems. They were kind of the wrong products as people are rotating towards um, experiences and restaurants and hotels and getting back out. So I'm not sure that we should be over extrapolating some of the bad news from those retails. But I will tell you, it surely shook the market in the middle part of this week. So that's the glass half full uh, view of these retail earnings, that basically it is a mix issue, not a consumer health issue. And some people would agree with you, Jonathan, but doesn't that give you a sense that the Fed is going to raise rates all the more so to try to stave off some of the inflationary pressure because the consumer still has momentum and that presents a valuation problem for stocks as we were hearing from Savita Subramanian of Bank of America earlier this morning? Yeah, I'm not sure that the Fed responds to the, the retail earnings, uh, but I but I, I mean, but generally they, but, the trend. But, but listen, wage inflation is really high. When 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 a year ago, when we when we had three percent inflation, people were saying is, oh, that's peaking. There's no way it could get to four percent. And now we're, we're over eight. So the Fed, I don't want to say they're on autopilot for a little while, but they're going to have to push rates, you know, at least to three percent, which is what the market's discounting. And my view is by the end of next year, we may be closer to 4% on, on Fed funds if, if they need to, you know, really, uh, but you know. Hold on a second, Jonathan. In all honesty, then, how can stocks keep rallying? How can you get to near 5,000 by the end of the year on the S&P if you get a 3 or 4% Fed funds rate? Well, I mean, the most important thing is corporate profits are holding up really well. And, and so take a look at this, this earnings season. Revenues are running on the S&P 14% this quarter. Earnings are up 12. So the margin pressure is tiny. But we had this really weird thing going on with the banks, with reserve releases. And if you took that out, the revenues were 15% and the EPS was 20. So the earnings are right. super powerful and stocks are cheap at this point. John, 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 that is the most intelligent thing I've heard this week on equity optimism. That differential equation is linked at the hip with nominal GDP and the decline. Are you suggesting within all the Credit Suisse work that the great miss here is that nominal GDP will sustain longer, which will allow companies to adapt into the gloom Lisa just mentioned? Uh, Tom, I think that is the only story. I mean, my favorite, the, the, the one screen that I look at the most of my Bloomberg terminal is ECFC. What, where is the consensus view on what the economy is going to do over the next quarter and year and two years? And what it tells you is that nominal GDP this year yeah. should run at 9%. I mean, normal is 35 For all of those folks who say, oh, we're going into recession, economists right. all over are basically saying this is a, a uh -oh. rip-roaring economy. You know, I'm going to tear up here, John. Golub, John Farrow, John Golub has really drunk the Kool-Aid at Credit Suisse, Donaldson, Lufkin, Jen Rett. He's on the edge of Tom Galvin here with a sales-centric uh, view. I'm going to try and be polite here. Um, ECFC, okay. John, has that ever been a leading indicator for anything? Well, I mean, you know, Jonathan, you have to use some framework to say directionally, where do we think that the economy is, is, is going? So if you're looking at, you know, where inflation is going, you can look at the tips market. If you're looking where GDP is, it's not, there's no tradable instrument on your Bloomberg. You have no choice but to use either your own house economists, who's, and, and, and our economists guys are also pretty bullish, but or, but, or you could just say, where's, where's the whole gang thinking that, um, that, that the, the growth is going to be? And, and that's what you find on the terminal. And not only can you do it,
but I can see it by firm. So I can say, what are the biggest shops? What do the people at the Fed think it's going to be? They're all in the same direction, which is the underlying economic growth measured in nominal dollars, that's including inflation, yeah. is going to be really strong this year. And here's the most important thing, and really strong next year as well. That's, I'm with yeah, you, that's John. not Golub's view. That's, that's, that's no, what I hear all that. Like. I hear all that. It's just the Fed forecast. John, when did the Fed ever forecast a recession? I mean, it's just not, well, it's they, not they, in their business, they do is it? it? They, do it with, they do it about a year, with a year delay. You know, they're, they're, <laughs> they do it after the fact. But, but I, listen, I, I get that, but you have to use some framework to saying, where do you think the world is going? If, if you ask me what the most important issue is on inflation and growth, we have an incredibly tight labor market, which is leaving the consumer really confident in their ability to find work. And, and that leads people to be willing to go out and overextend themselves on credit. And it also means that you have high wage inflation. You add those two things together. It's all about the labor market. And, and that's my take, independent of what you have on that, uh, that forecasting screen. A defiant bull. John, it's going to catch up, buddy, as always. Jonathan Gollub there of Credit Suisse. Bramo, I will give John this. That retail story this week, far more nuanced than first look. Absolutely, especially because of Home Depot, and to a lesser extent, Lowe's, as he was saying. That said, there clearly is a margin issue that we have to get our hands around and understand. I like the ECFC function. It's not, you know, I've not got a problem with the function. Just, I'm not sure what it forecasts and how accurate that's been over the years. Futures on the S&P up a little more than 1%. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden arrived in South Korea and immediately underscored the importance of resolving the global semiconductor shortage. The president toured a Samsung chip factory that is the model for one the company plans to build in Texas. The White House says the Texas plant will mean good paying jobs and more resilience in the supply chain. Meanwhile, Bloomberg's learned that President Biden is considering a meeting with Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman as soon as next month. That would mark a shift for the president. He is a avoided contact with the Crown Prince over the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. PIMCO and BlackRock are amongst the firms set to start debt talks with Sri Lanka soon. Bloomberg's learned that Alliance Bernstein, T. Rao Price and Wellington are also amongst the members of a creditors group. Sri Lanka fell into default this week for the first time in its history. An economic meltdown has led to protests and a political crisis. And the largest maker of agricultural machinery, Deere, reported quarterly sales that were below estimates. The company says that higher costs had an impact on farmers. Disruptions related to the invasion of Ukraine helped elevate prices of fuel and feedstock. That could lead to farmers to put off investments in machinery. And SpaceX reportedly paid $250,000 to settle an employee's claim that she was sexually harassed by Elon Musk. According to the online news site Insider, the rocket launch company made the payment to a flight attendant who worked as a contractor employee on the SpaceX corporate jet. Musk, who's the founder and CEO of the company, calls the accusations utterly untrue. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. What we're seeing in the markets is a rotation from growth stocks with earnings very far in the future towards stocks that are, are much more value stocks, earnings here in the present. And this reflects the fact that real rates for the first time in a very long time are likely to go positive in 2023. Great conversation with Ken Griffin of Citadel there alongside Francine Lacroix yesterday here in New York City. From New York, good morning to you. Futures are positive by a little more than 1% on the S&P, on the Nasdaq 100 by 1.5. Yields traveling north, heading up higher by three basis points, 286.95. And the euro just a little bit negative, backing away from 106, Tom, 105.75. It's going to be interesting. What do you think of Ken Griffin's comments, John? I didn't see them all, but I know you were studying that carefully. Did we learn anything? He had something interesting to say about retail traders and Wall Street bets going after a certain hedge fund. Yeah. And how that wasn't nice because it was about going after teachers' pensions, which... Lit up Twitter. I have to say, I didn't really fully resonate with me, Tom. 
So, so political. Thank you to Francine Lacroix for bringing up that third rail of sensitivity. Uh, it's a great interview there. just to probe like that and just to yeah. get him to go deeper yeah. on it. I thought she did a brilliant yeah. job. I'm going to stay out of it, as is Mr. Farrow, because we'd like to work Monday. Right now, and this is really important, a gentle lady from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is with us. Katie Kaminsky is chief research strategist of Alpha Simplex, and she and I are going to drag ourselves back in years to what mattered the last time commodities really lifted. Katie Kaminsky, you and I are not going to turn this into a nerd fest, but let's be honest. The reason the commodity game exists, as John Farrow mentioned, this copper staggering a little bit here, is commodities trend like nothing else. Are commodities going to trend into 2023 where I can find alpha? I would have to agree, yes. And let me give you a couple of pointers for this. Please. Inflation, first of all, is something that's very positive for commodity returns. Investors have forgotten about commodities because they haven't worked in a low inflation environment. Now, let's take oil as an example. Oil prices have remained high despite some very, very negative things like a strong dollar, weakening demand in China, but yet we're still at pretty high oil prices. So what that tells me is there's still very much a commodity story that's left. And I think investors have forgotten about the value of commodities in a low inflation environment. I'm going to go back to Tusha Shandy and a lot of the people that invented this and the whole CTA, Ballet, Monroe, Trout, and all. Do you buy individual commodities as Pharaoh does? Folks, you should see Pharaoh on commercial break. He's over at the LME looking at aluminum and the whole thing. Do you buy individual commodities or do you buy a modern manufactured index or ETF? Well, this is a good question because different okay, commodities... Okay. Yeah, um, different commodities react differently to different environments. And so let's take last year or during COVID, we saw a very different move in energies than we saw in the precious metal basket. So certain commodities are more linked to inflation and then are affected by different supply and demand cycles. So thus, you should really think a little bit about what you're buying, what it's linked to, what type of cycles are going on in the markets and which ones might be favorable given the current macro conditions. I'm always a big fan also of thinking about long and short. The reason for this is that over the long term, statistically, long and short indices and strategies and commodities have done better than long only. But I still suggest that you can add some long only exposure during certain cycles, which might actually help offset some of these really difficult moves we've seen in equities and bonds. Well, Katie, that's, that's exactly where I wanted to go, that we're talking about the move in commodities and betting on potential commodity producers and, uh, and the like at a time when nothing else is working. Is commodity still the only bright spot or do you see some of the other pockets starting to work again, like bonds? Yes, the interesting thing about that connection, if you look back in the 70s, and I know it's a long time ago, it seems, Watch but we yourself. had a very, okay, sorry about that. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting period to compare with because what in that environment, we saw increased commodity prices. We saw bond and stock volatility being higher. Does that sound like what we've seen this month? And secondly, we saw positive correlation between stocks and bonds on occasion. Plus, we also saw commodity commodities occasionally having different correlations with equities. And that is sounding like this month and this year. And so what that tells me is that there's going to be time varying interesting opportunities. I just say that for now, I'd stay away from long bonds as you wait for rates to rise. Um, but there could be some opportunities eventually as we see more yield. Um, but commodities is still really the asset that's going to move the most with inflation and that has the highest potential to uh, provide some offsetting return to what is a very challenging market environment. Katie, what would you say to the Jonathan Gollops of the world who say that people have gotten way too bearish on stocks because, frankly, on a nominal basis, you get growth. On a nominal basis, you get revenues. On a nominal basis, a lot of these companies also provide an inflation hedge. 
That's good as a point, but that's not a short-term view. I think the problem is we have to navigate the next few months. We need to navigate the rising rate environment. And so I think, you know, even for bond investors, yeah, bonds give you a positive yield over time, but when yields are going up, it hurts. And so I think the point is he's right that you want to hold stocks over the long run, but you could also try and find ways to protect your portfolio in the short run as inflation and rising rates and growth destruction are a real challenge in a more uncertain environment. Kelly, thank you. As always, wonderful to hear from you. Kelly Kaminsky there of Alpha Simplex. Lisa, I can find a lot of people who are bullish into year end. I can find very few who are bullish into the end of the summer. I can hardly find any. Yeah, although if you look six months after that, they start to get a little more bullish, which raises an interesting question. What actually triggers that, right? What triggers that capitulation? Right now, there is so much pessimism based on this idea that the Fed is hiking into weakness, right? We talk about it with the ECB, but that essentially is what the Fed is committing to. How do they deal with it at a time when valuations uh, still are stretched, at least in certain areas that people point to? You know what the hope is. We get a few more months of inflation data. Hopefully, it's convincing enough that we're on the right trend with inflation coming in lower, and then we get to the end of summer and the Fed backs away, Tom. What backing away actually means I'm going to find interesting. Is it 25 basis point hikes? Is it a pause? What is backing away? Again, it's nonlinear, John. Let me get this calendar up here. I'm distracted by that wonderful trend-based discussion on uh, commodities. Sorry, John. What, what, What... uh, my, my, did, what are you did, looking did for? Did you pay for my terminal this week? It's paid for. Okay, June 15th is a meeting. Uh, that's huge. You can, and wrapped around the ECB meeting as well. Those are really non-analyzable. They're there, fine, whatever they do. I'm sorry, July 27, September 21, November 2nd, massively data-dependent, massively nonlinear effects. September. Lisa, that's the one to look for. And I would say Jackson Hole ahead of that in August. I was actually just talking about Jackson Hole last night with someone talking about how they're going to position, uh, given the fact that they're going to get that data, right? How can they say they're data dependent continually if the data is in and it shows a very decisive trend? I think based on the data of the last 12 months, I don't think anyone can say this Fed's been data dependent. I I don't know why we keep doing this. Go on, Tom. The biggest problem that we've got is at the Pioneer Grill at Jackson Hole Lodge, they don't do a full English. They do a full Wyoming. It's a bigger breakfast. Is it a better breakfast? It's not better. It's, it's a bigger Is breakfast. It better? <laughs> it's okay. full. I can see you bigger there in a cowboy better. hat with a leathers on and the Tony I, I, Lama two tones. Don't about the leathers. Pioneer Grill, John Farrow. I'll do my best to get there. The risk right now is that when we look at equities so far, the derating that has happened was purely really a function of valuations. Expensive companies were extremely expensive, and that's where all the pain has been. Financial markets have a really tough time discounting things that are the likely to happen or may happen in the distant future. This delicate balancing act is what the Fed's got to navigate, what all central bankers have to navigate. We have to wait a little bit to see if what the Fed is doing is the right thing. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz, and Tom Keen on a Friday, an exhausting week, setting up for weekend reading, and then we will be in Davos, Switzerland uh, next week. John Farrow, the tumult of the week, a better tape this morning. This morning, but not on the week. Seven weeks of losses, that's what we're set for on the session, up by about 1%. And the question I keep hearing, asked repeatedly, have we seen the capitulation? Bank of America say this, real capitulation is Fed capitulation. It's a systemic event. It's unemployment rising. That's what's required first, at least in the view of Michael Hartnett over at B of A. The important reading for the weekend from Hartnett and John, what's so important there is that's leaking in the uh, linking in the economics with the market performance. But even looking at the market, John, we can't talk about capitulation with a VIX at 28.62. We're miles away. And people waiting for something north of 30, Tom, approaching yes. 40. Here's 40, my thing, yeah. TK. This week, people were really spooked by those target numbers, not because it was surprising, but because the market was so surprised by them. Just in terms of the reaction, to see a stock down close to 25%, just like that, TK, off the back of a story we all thought we really understood and also thought was increasingly well-priced, I think that was a shock for some people to find out that maybe it wasn't. 
There are tea leaves out there, John, like Pakistan, Rupi, uh, Turkish Lira, and the rest. But the really underpinning here to the lack of capitulation is resilient dollar and somewhat of a quiescent bond market within the new bond volatility. The biggest story, Tom, and I think it's going to resonate with people far outside Wall Street, we have a cost of living crisis around the world. Growth is heading in the wrong direction. Inflation yeah. is heading in the wrong direction. We haven't experienced that in the developed world for a long, long <clears> time. Not at this level, not as broad as this. And for the Europeans, I think that's the one to watch because they're at, right at the leading edge of all of right. this. Do they have to hike into a weaker economy? That's why for me at the next meeting, the ECB June 9th, it's a lot of pressure on President Lagarde to find the right path forward, and I'm not sure there is one. And Lisa, I'm glad that John mentions this, because I've been remiss on this today and, frankly, through the week as well. 9% is my statistic of the week. Maybe it's on the edge of double-digit inflation in the United Kingdom. Difficult German production inflation data today out of, of, of Germany. We're almost becoming used to it. We're rationalizing high inflation in America. And 1970s continues to be the benchmark, not necessarily saying we're seeing a repeat of the 1970s, but to Today, the UK consumer confidence read came out at the lowest levels going back to the 1970s just because of that dynamic that John and you are both talking about. How much do we see this <clears throat> paint a similar picture in the United States, right. right? Or how much is it a distinction that we <clears throat> see with momentum that people keep talking about that distinguishes the US from other nations? John, for the first time since time began, I'm almost on the same page with Klaus Schwab of Davos. I've been a critic of their themes and how far they are behind. I've and got to laugh through that, Tom. Yeah, You're on the same page as Klaus. No, I'm not on the same page as Klaus. But Dr. Schwab is saying history at a turning point. And for me, my, my, my phrase, my theme for this Davos is Davos and the end of the holiday from history. The holiday from history is so over. And, John, we are, this is underplayed this week because Ukraine is such a grind right now. This news in international relations folds into our markets. Tom, I won't be at this event. I just wonder from your perspective. Historically, you and I have been there a lot together. It's usually completely divorced from reality. Yes. Do you sense next week will be different? I sense that about every seven years, Davos is overtaken by the news flow. Why wouldn't that be this time around where all the certitude and belief is out there and themes and all the mumbo jumbo and it's just swept away by the news flow? Looking forward to your coverage, Tom, through next week. Futures positive on the S&P by a little more than 1%. On the Nasdaq 100, up by 1.5%. Yields are high by about three basis points on a 10-year, 286 77. Bit of quiet out there. So yeah. welcome quiet, some peace and quiet for now at least. Futures positive, Tom. Largely boosted a little bit at least by what happened with China. Right. Chinese banks cutting rates. Let's jump into it right now. The gentleman who knows the Cubs are behind the mark here in April and into May and maybe we'll look forward not to Cubs baseball but maybe what our Federal Reserve System will do. James Bianco is founder and president of Bianco Research. Jim, what are you going to write about this weekend? Uh, about the economy, I think, in that there is a fundamental shift going on. It's probably the biggest story that no one talks about is this whole work from home phenomenon is something real and it's something that's going to last. A recent study said that only 8% of the offices in Manhattan are back to full time. Everybody else is either work from home or hybrid. I think it was behind the target numbers, too. They've got an inventory build on a lot of stuff people don't want. Because when you've shifted your patterns of work and home, you shift your consumption basket. And I don't think we're ready to acknowledge that that's happening. Mm -hmm. And that's keeping the economy off sides. And that's keeping a friction in the economy and inflation higher than it would otherwise be. So, Jim, what does that tell you about this week? Does that highlight the struggle the C-suite is having navigating this economy, one? Or two, does it signal a weakening of the economy? Because we traded on the latter, really, not so much on the former. Yeah, um, we are trading on a weakening of the economy. And you've also seen it, say, in things like the Bank of America survey, where all of a sudden monetary tightening monetary policy and global recession have surpassed inflation as the number one tail risk for the first time in many months. And everybody is now worried about a, uh, about a global slowdown. I am, too. But then they come to the conclusion that the Federal Reserve and other central banks are going to have to pause or pull back on their tightening after some round of uh, initial tightening, say, in, in the June meeting and maybe in the July meeting. And I don't see that. I see the central banks as being committed to trying to rein in inflation. And if you want to put it in market parlance, the Fed put is about unemployment and the inflation statistics. It's not about what level of the S&P do they change at. 
It's at what level does inflation have to come down to or maybe unemployment have to rise? And I don't think a lot of people are, at least on Wall Street, ready to accept that as an answer. They think the Fed's going to stop because they're having a lot of pain. But a lot of people that have to live on a fixed income, that's who the Fed is focused on. Jim, translate your view into a market call where a lot of people are saying buy the dip in bonds and they're seeing a peak in yields exactly because of what you're saying, because they do believe that central banks will pause, that we will get inflation under control still, and that we can move along back to some sort of normal that we remember. What's your view on that? You know, it's possible that we saw the high last week at 320 on the 10 year note, but I would probably bet not. What I think we're seeing now is a flight to quality. The, the stock market has been so volatile as of late uh, that it's really trading, the bond in the stock market are trading as one. If you see a serious rebound in the stock market, you know, you're, you're right, we're about to have the seventh up down week in a row. If we actually had two up weeks in a row and you didn't see bonds make a run back at 320, then you'd have a chance of saying that we've seen the high. But I have a feeling that once the stock market finds its sea legs and then attempts a retracement rally, that yields are just going to go right back up again. So I understand the argument for 320, uh, 10-year being the high of the year. I'm just not sold on it yet. So where do you think uh, we really see that capitulation? Can you elaborate a little bit more about the balance of buyers of some of these bonds and what people might not be understanding fully? <clears throat> well, a lot. There's been, there's been, at least in the statistics, not a whole lot of capitulation. If you look at the future statistics or the surveys of managers, there's nothing there that suggests that we've ever gotten to an extreme short or underweight position to begin with. So it's been a year of real pain for fixed income managers. I suspect that they're still holding out hope that the slowness in the economy will get the Fed to stop. And that's why that they're, they're trying to make the case for a turnaround and a rally in bonds. But I, but I still think that the capitulation is to come. One other thing, whenever you've seen throughout the last 50 years, whenever you've seen yields go up this much or total returns in the bond market, that's including price, fall this much, I always like to say that the bond market doesn't peak in yields until something changes. So it's usually bond yields go up a lot and something big happened like a recession or like a financial crisis or a, a serious slowdown in the economy at a minimum. And then that was the peak in yields. If last Tuesday was the high in yields, you'd say we had one of the biggest rises in yields or biggest declines in total return. And then some random Tuesday they peaked and that was the end of it. <laughs> I'm not so sure that that's going to be the case this time. Hey, Jim. Awesome to hear from you, buddy. Thank you. Jim Bianco there of Bianco Research. Some of this has been pretty random. Talk to a lot of people in fixed income about this. On any given day, you can have a move of 10, 15 basis points in either direction in the Treasury market, Tom, on any given day without much of a catalyst. Well, yeah. Look, I, I, I mentioned this earlier. I thought Michael Collins was just brilliant with PGM. I, I think there's a, the, 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 the verbal, John, of a bond bear market is radically different than the verbal of an equity bear market. And the magnitude of this drop in price, people, this is all new. I mean, people are making it up in bonds, not as they go, but literally hour by hour. It's well, that Tom, serious. To that point, and you can speak to this, we've seen a lot of corrections over the last few decades. We've seen a few bear markets along the way. How many people can say they experienced a bond bear market? Very few. Very few can actually say they've worked through that. Back to the 70s. You can just, you do a log chart of the Bloomberg Total Return Index. Pick the credit level, John. I don't care. And the answer is this is very 78, 79 and into Paul Volcker. I mean, you said, it. You said it. it. It's very 70s. Bram Late 70s. You said is a difference. <laughs> okay. No, there's well, a difference. It was before K-pop. I think, though, there is a larger point here about liquidity and the issue of just the incredible swings that you're seeing and the lack of conviction and where that stability comes from. This is supposed to be the deepest market, most liquid bond market in the world. What happened to that liquidity? Mohammed al has been saying the same thing repeatedly over the last few months. Futures are positive by about 1% on the S&P and the NASDAQ up by 125 From New York City, this is Bloomberg.
Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden arrived in South Korea and immediately underscored the importance of resolving the global semiconductor shortage. The president toured a Samsung chip factory that is the model for one of the company that plans to build in Texas. The White House says the Texas plant will mean good paying jobs and more resilience in the supply chain. More aid is on the way to Ukraine. A group of seven finance ministers meeting in Germany are set to agree on more than $19 billion for Ukraine to guarantee the short-term finances of its government. That's according to Germany's finance minister. Meanwhile, the U.S. Senate has passed an aid package for Ukraine worth more than $40 billion and sent it to President Biden for his signature. And the administration said it was providing Ukraine with another $100 million in military assistance. Finland is becoming the third European country to be cut off from Russian and natural gas. Like Poland and Bulgaria, Finland is refusing to pay for the fuel in rubles. The lost supplies will probably have a limited impact on the Finnish economy, though. Russian gas just accounts for about 5% of the country's energy mix. And in China, banks have taken a step aimed at boosting the ailing economy. They cut a key interest rate for long-term loans by a record amount, lowering the five-year loan prime rate would reduce mortgage costs, and it may help counter some weak loan demand caused by a property slump and, of course, those COVID lockdowns. And another roadblock for Boeing, which is trying to get airlines in China to resume flying the 737 MAX. Uh, China Eastern Airlines has outlined several actions it needs to take before operating the MAX again. Amongst them, more pilot training and modifications to the aircraft. Boeing says it continues to work with both airlines and regulators. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. It is inflation. In the short term, it is inflation. In the long term, we need sustainable growth for all of our economies. We have to rehabilitate um, uh, growth in a sustainable, inclusive way. It is for all G7 member states, all G7 countries, a key priority to fight inflation. Good to catch up and hear from Christian Linder, the German finance minister, a little bit earlier this morning. From New York City, good morning. Futures are positive on the S&P, Tom, by a little more than 1%. On the Nasdaq, up by one4 Very good. Uh, and uh, you get the VIX under 30 nicely. 28.70 gives you some of the quiet that we're seeing in the market after this historic week. Right now, in an important conversation, and I'll go to John Farrow here in a moment, but I want to slip in one question. With the United Kingdom's Secretary of State for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy, he, John, and the rest of the nation enjoying a 9% inflation. Kwasi Kwarteng is with us. He's celebrating Liverpool's European dominance and more than anything understands the gridlock of British politics, author a decade ago of Gridlock Nation. What's the level of gridlock right now, Minister, in terms of dealing with 9% inflation? Well, it's a huge uh, challenge, Tom, and you will know that uh, it's a global challenge. We had a pandemic. We had lockdowns uh, right across the world. We had a huge surge in demand uh, when those lockdowns uh, were eased. And now we've got this unprecedented uh, situation in uh, Ukraine, first time in 70 years, 75 years, uh, that we're seeing an actual war uh, in Europe. So uh, these are unprecedented times. And the British government has very much uh, decided uh, to help uh, consumers help uh, people in the UK. We had a, a good uh, announcement from the Chancellor in February about the kind of help uh, that he was willing to give. Uh, and he and the Prime Minister have said that they are looking uh, to help people more. Let's talk uh, about in, that in and whether situation. the consumer, the people of the UK are feeling that right now. Because you wrote a letter recently to petrol retailers about the concerns that the Chancellor's 5p fuel duty cut wasn't being passed on in any visible or meaningful way. What's the response been? Well, we're, we're looking at that still. I mean, I think it's uh, very wrong of uh, petrol, um, the, the, the four courts, uh, not to pass on the reduction. Um, and I think, you know, we, we're seeing that there's some behavior change, but they could, there's a lot more they could do. And I'm very keen that they, they actually help out. And, and yet you're against on. the windfall tax. Why is that? I've been always against uh, windfall tax. I think they're arbitrary. Uh, I think they discourage investment. And when you look at the companies that um, invest uh, in uh, the North Sea, uh, you know, it's a very cyclical business. So when they make money, they make, tend to make a lot of money. And then when they lose, they, they, they make big losses. 
uh, and they're not they're not supported when they do make those losses. You've talked about However, investment in the UK, and you're worried that it would yeah. deter investment. Bernard Looney of sure. BP said to the Times earlier this month, he was asked basically whether he changed any spending plans because of a windfall tax, and he said, "quote There are none that we wouldn't do." Isn't that good news? That you can no, do well, this. That he won't change his spending plans. He's telling you. Well, it's up to Bernard. I mean, you can speak to Bernard uh, directly yourself. I'm not quite sure what he was referring to, but there's no doubt that other players in the industry uh, say that any kind of windfall tax would deter future investment. I mean, that's uh, pretty obvious. Um, and they need fiscal certainty. They don't want uh, rabbits out of the hat, so to speak. Well, BP's the telling us the opposite. That, I just wanted to jump in with something the Chancellor said, sure. too. The Chancellor said, what I want to see is significant investment back into the UK economy to support jobs to support energy security, and I want to see that soon. If that doesn't happen, then no options are off the table. Now, as you know, Quasi, the prudent response from any chancellor is not to take things off the table ahead of a budget. Exactly right. But I want your view on that. I want some goals. I want to understand what kind of investments you want to see from these players and over what time frame, because if we're going to wait for these guys, they've got a 10-year time horizon for their spending plans, we'll be out a decade, and then we'll say, oh, OK, maybe we should do a windfall tax now. What's the time frame? How much spending do you want to see over what time? We want to see spending. I'm not going to quantify it, but we want to see actual real spending. And there's evidence that they're doing that. I mean, if you look at our program for carbon capture, uh, blue hydrogen production, both Shell and BP are directly involved uh, in that uh, in the northeast of our country, of England. Uh, and they, they, they can see uh, that uh, there is a huge opportunity in terms of green investment. And that's exactly what the, the, the chance of the kind of investment the Chancellor wants to see. And as you say, the Chancellor's quite right to say uh, all options are on the table. Every Chancellor I've known since I've been a, uh, an MP has always said that. There's no way that he's going to take options off the right. table ahead of the budget. Dr. Corting, you enjoy a PhD in economic history from a small shop, the University of Cambridge. <laughs> you know the history right. of this, and the simple history is windfall profit taxes do not work period. It's well documented. But as John alludes to, there is a generational trust that has been broken between corporate elites and the people. How do you guarantee, given the lack of trust, a process here that helps the people of the United Kingdom? So that's why the Chancellor was very clear, Tom, that uh, they have to invest uh, in the UK. We want to see their ambitions uh, realized by their Do you investment. need it in investment... writing? Does, is, is it so urgent that it needs to be codified, to be in writing? I think, I think the commitments uh, are already there. I'm not sure that we need any kind of legal document or quasi-legal document. But what, what uh, they understand is that these new technologies, uh, the decarbonization, all of that stuff, uh, needs investment. And it actually creates jobs. And you will also know that we're very interested, uh, very focused on levelling up. That's actually giving opportunity to areas of our country in the UK, which in the last few years, few decades, have been underinvested. And so BP and Shell and others know that our commitment uh, to levelling up and our commitment uh, also to, to uh, decarbonisation mean that, that business uh, investment needs to happen, and they're very aware of that. And they also know, as the Chancellor said, that if they don't step up to that plate, uh, then they could well be subject to a windfall tax. Because I think just, that's a reasonable conversation. Just a final question, sir. Just on the final point, to understand what people are going through right now, if they listen to this conversation, you've got a company, BP, engaged in buybacks. I'm not here to say that's the wrong thing. They've referred to themselves as a cash machine when oil prices are climbing like they are. You've got the CEO who's saying he wouldn't change his spending plan if he faced the windfall tax. And we've got the government saying, we don't want to do that. You're saying that. Do you understand how deeply uncomfortable that might be for people who can't pay their energy bills this month? Look, it's really difficult, but the, the investment actually helps people. People have pension plans. They, have, uh, they want to have jobs. Uh, they want to have energy security. So I can't, as an energy uh, minister, say, please invest in our energy security of supply, but by the way, I'm going to give you a, a windfall tax. That doesn't make sense. In order to, to protect energy supply, we need investment. And in order to have investment, uh, they need a, we need a, fis a stable fiscal situation. We can't simply just threaten people with or have arbitrary windfall taxes. Having said all of that, uh, as you know, the Chancellor of the Exchequer is responsible for the budget, and yep. he's not taking any options off the table. And he and wouldn't be right the first Chancellor to, to do it, as you know, because we could exactly. go back to the Conservative Chancellor of 1981. 
who did something similar. Kwasi, thank you. Great to catch up. Thank Let's you catch very up soon. Much. Thank you, sir. Kwasi Kwateng of uh, the UK, the Secretary of Energy and Business. TK, what a difficult moment for a lot of people. It's not only a conversation in the United Kingdom. I think you're going to get a repeat of that rinse and repeat here in America in months. Live from New York City for our audience worldwide on TV and radio, this is Bloomberg. Live from New York City this morning, good morning on TV and radio for our audience worldwide. We have a little bit of a pop, a bounce, a rally, whatever you want to call it. We're positive on the S&P, up by a little more than 1%. On the Nasdaq, up by 1.5. Yields unchanged now on a 10-year, 283.70. Unchanged on the session, down on the week for a second straight week. Equities, unfortunately, for many of you, down on the week as well for a seventh straight week. TK, it has been... Pretty ugly out there over the last two months. Almost as ugly as in Liverpool. Right now, John Riding joining us here, Chief Economic Advisor at Breen Capital. But on a Friday before the close of Premier League football, Lisa and I opened this up for full discussion with a gentleman of Preston North End and young Farrow as well. John Farrow, the only player I remember from my youth was Gerard. Oh, you love him, don't you? I, I, I don't understand why I loved him, but I loved him. And I want you and Riding to talk right now about Sunday and for America, why Steve Gerrard really matters. There's a great subplot to the story on Sunday. So on Sunday, you've got Manchester City top of the league of the Premier League. You've got Liverpool second. Manchester City win. It's all over. But Manchester City, John Riding are playing Aston Villa and Aston Villa are coached by Stevie G, the former great captain of Liverpool. That is a nice little subplot going into Sunday's games. Yeah, and, and add to the fact that uh, two of uh, the key players for Aston Villa are former Liverpool players in Danny Ings uh, and in Philip Coutinho, uh, who were arrested against Wolverhampton uh, yesterday, uh, sorry, against Burnley yesterday, and uh, you've got a, a potential uh, uh, chance for those uh, two. If, 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 if they hold City, they'll deserve uh, winners' medals from Liverpool. That is a big, big game. Tom, not just for Manchester City and Liverpool, but for some of those people at Aston Villa as well. So lining things up on Sunday, Tom, I've talked Eastern time, 11 Eastern, all the games all at once, the final games of the year, yeah. all played simultaneously. It is great to see. Lisa, is there a soccer bar in Davos? I, I mean, is this what I'm we're sure you'll find on one, Sunday? Tom. Oh, I'm the Bramble Cam caught her not paying attention. <laughs> Just leave me what out of this shock. one. I'm good. I'm good. I wanted to talk about uh, John Riding's experience yeah, Lisa, at the Atlanta Fed. And and I wanted to actually John wants talk, to talk about, about Liverpool and Preston. I know. North well, end. fine, John, but I want to talk about the Fed. So bear Please, with me. Lisa. Let me just take a quick uh, move over there, and then you guys can all talk about football. Thank you. And I will let you go to the pub together on it. I am curious, though, especially after being at the Atlanta Fed uh, confab just recently, there seems to be a belief in Mark markets that the Fed is going to recognize the slowdown that we're seeing in some of the data and respond by pausing, by not raising rates as much. That seems to be opposite the rhetoric from Fed officials. What was the scuttlebutt when people were talking to you, when they were not on camera, when they were not on the podia? What did they say when it came to their frustration with markets and their belief in a Fed put? Well, what's remarkable is they don't pay, Fed officials don't pay anywhere near as much attention to the markets as we do on a day-to-day, -day, sadly, minute-to-minute -minute, uh, basis. Um, and you have to think, where were the markets? In the fourth quarter of last year, before the Fed had made its pivot, they were seeing very little interest rate action uh, from the Fed this year. And then they overshot Fed guidance this year uh, to get into the point where it was almost half a point at every meeting. Uh, and now uh, markets are, are pulling back a bit. I think the Fed's looking, they, they've, they've laid out the game plan. We want to get some rate hikes underneath our belt. Uh, and we're going to get 50 basis points done in June, 50 basis points done in July. That takes you to the September meeting. And that is really the key meeting, for I think, for where short-term interest rates are going, because it's all about inflation persistence at that point. Uh, and if inflation has ebbed sufficiently, then they're going to look for an opportunity to dial back, I think, on the rate hikes and slow to quarter-point rate hikes. But the experience that people have had with the Fed for the last 20 years or so will not 
particularly help them guide the Fed because it's different because we've got 19, late 70s, early 80s style inflation. We haven't had that in the last 20 or 30, well, obviously in the last 40 years doing arithmetic. Uh, and so market responses to the Fed, equity market responses to the Fed, aren't, uh, we're not going to see the same kind of uh, sensitivity uh, of the Fed to market moves yeah. uh, as we've had when inflation was not a problem. So, John, it actually is probably appropriate that you guys started the conversation talking about football and that people would rather talk about football right now than this because it's basically been the same story for a number of weeks now. And basically, the Fed is going to do its thing. It's on autopilot. Let's reconvene in September and see what happens. It's a quiet day for data, for data, excuse me. Going forward, what's going to change this narrative? Is there a data point or a series of them that you're looking for to really guide into September? It's... The persistence of inflation, Lisa. Uh, the Fed, my all, all my interactions, all my reading, the, the, the Fed is serious about getting inflation back towards the 2% target. And the problem is they don't know what it's going to take to get there. Th there's something of an odd narrative coming from Fed officials where they talk about 2.5% being neutral because that's the long-run neutral rate when inflation is back at the 2% target rate. And right now, inflation is much, much higher than that. And underlying inflation is probably somewhere around 4%. So the Fed's talking about, well, we need to get back to neutral, and then maybe we'll have to get a, a little bit restrictive and throwing that 2.5% number out there as the estimate of neutral once inflation is defeated. And that's a little bit putting the cart before the horse when you're trying to defeat inflation. But they are insistent, I think, they're going to get move towards that 2% target. And so... The opportunity to dial back is going to depend how much inflation has fallen over the summer. And I, I think that the chances are that inflation doesn't ebb as much as the Fed is hoping at this point. Because the broad, for two things, there's the broad-based nature uh, of the price increases. And, and we calculate in the last CPI report, for example, uh, there was 63% uh, of the items within CPI that were rising at a 6% or faster uh, rate over the last year. So that, that, that's very broad-based persistence. That's the first thing. And secondly, there's inflation <clears throat> expectations by the public. And they are holding in, uh, in longer-term expectations by their fingernails. And yesterday, um, we had the Philadelphia Fed reporting that 10-year inflation expectations by businesses had gone up from 3 to 3.5%. 3 and people are seeing food price increases. And very sadly, and this conflict in the Ukraine has such terrible humanitarian dimensions. But the main economic dimension for the U.S. may well be higher food prices because of the impact on grain exports, because of the impact on fertilizers. And that feeds into people's expectations because that is repeat shopping every week okay. where they see prices John, rise. That was a clinic. I, I want to go back to David Melpass, John Writing, and Conrad DeQuadros of ages and ages ago, John. And the bottom line is maybe for whatever reasons, your worry back then has happened. We are so far from any constructed Taylor rule right now, it's unthinkable. And as you correctly say, we're hanging on to inflation expectations by our fingernails. What do institutional leaders do to quell the fear of higher inflation expectations? What's the prescription to keep us hanging on by our fingernails? Well, I, I think what we really need is a new monetary policy framework strategy. I think one area... Targeting? Fed, Are you you're going to go all New Zealand on me here? Well, look, the Fed has a 2% inflation target and had a 2% inflation target. That but they out. bemoaned missing it to the low end by a few tenths of a percentage point. So they adopted a deliberate strategy to raise inflation and, the, and raise it above 2% by a moderate amount for some time. And now careful what you wish for, we've got it substantially above 2% for a prolonged period of time. And, and now, what, what, is the, what is the strategy? They need to really reassure the public in various ways, not just in Fed statements, that they are very serious in getting inflation down. Because it turns out, 
Inflation is not the stimulus to economic activity that the Fed hoped, at least moderate inflation. It's hard to hold it at 2%, and the public hates inflation. Uh, you know, Jonathan and I, for example, have talked about this a lot, about what our mothers think about it, and neither of our mothers think that uh, inflation is very good for them when they see what's okay, happening John, to the utility bills. John Farrell, talk about that right now. You and Riding are living this in real time. Oh, the family chat yesterday was lighting up, Tom, just in terms of petrol prices going up, up, up and away. And John, just to speak to what the mums are going through right now, for you and I, for personally, the, the call I get all the time is about a utility bill at the end of the month. And for those listening in, don't worry, I pay it. And I'm sure John does too. And John, things are getting really, really tough for people. What we saw this week from the retailers was just a shift in where they're spending. I'm not sure if we saw a drop off in how much they're spending, though, John, because when I hear from the airlines, the airlines are talking up how robust things are, how resilient the consumer is, that the price tolerance is still there. What's your read on that, John? Well, I, I think that's right. I think that companies are having difficulty managing a, an inflationary environment and an environment in which there are severe labor shortages. Uh, you know, we need more workers. And, and you, you know, th this is a weekend, fortunately, across New York City where we're going to see uh, those future workers uh, appear, as you see all the uh, grads, uh, graduates on, on the street. And, and that's great and that's hopeful for the future. But right now we're in an environment of labor market constraints. And those constraints are causing companies difficulty in managing, um, uh, managing their businesses. Uh, and so I, I think the story of those uh, retailers earlier in the week was really more of a margin story than it was a consumer spending story. After all, April retail sales looked fairly sprightly numbers. Yeah. April industrial production looked quite strong. Even April housing starts were, were flat on the first quarter, and that, that's the most interest-sensitive sector of the economy. So I, I think all these fears that this is really about demand shortages are misplaced. There's tremendous excess demand, almost two job openings per worker. As I said, that's good news for those graduating this weekend. Um, but, um, you know, it really... It, it, if we take some demand out of the economy, we're really taking excess demand out. Uh, and and I'm, my fears of recession in the short run are, are, are very low. The, the problem is the longer term if these inflation expectations mm. become embedded. John, 15 seconds on the clock. Finish where we started. Results Sunday. Prediction. Uh, Liverpool win and uh, Aston Villa hold City to a draw and the quadruple still on. There we go. John Riding of Bring Capital. John, thank you. Futures positive 1% from New York City. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Ritika Gupta. President Biden is in South Korea, where his immediate focus was on the semiconductor shortage that has dragged the on the global economy. The president toured a Samsung factory and has some of the biggest chip production lines in the world. Samsung is breaking ground this year on a semiconductor factory over in Texas. Meanwhile, Bloomberg's learned that President Biden is considering a meeting with Saudi Arabia's Mohammed bin Salman as soon as next month. That will mark a shift for the president. He's avoided contact with the crown prince over the murder of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. U.S. growth may outpace China's this year. That's for the first time since 1976. According to Bloomberg Economics, China's economy will grow just 2% this year due in part to coronavirus lockdowns. Meanwhile, the U.S. economy is likely to grow 2.8%. China's goal of around 5.5% this year was the lowest ever set. And the largest maker of agricultural machinery, Deere, reported quarterly sales that were below estimates. The company says that higher costs had an impact on farmers. Disruptions related to the invasion of Ukraine helped elevate prices of fuel and feedstock that could lead farmers to put off investments in machinery. And shares of Ross store plummeting in pre-market trade. The discount retailer cut its full-year outlook and first quarter results missed estimates. The outlook downgrade follows similar moves by Coles, Target and Walmart. Global News 24 hours a day on Aaron on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Ritika Gupta. This is Bloomberg. This delicate balancing act is what the Fed's got to navigate, what all central bankers have to navigate. And everybody's afraid that they're going to get it wrong. And the chances are that they will get it wrong. 
A spirited Lori Heino, Global Chief Executive Officer, Chief Investment Officer. I didn't want to give her a promotion there on a Friday. We were on her weekend with State Street Global Advisors. We're thrilled that she could join us uh, uh, here this morning. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keen, and we thank you for being with us. Uh, futures up 36. Kriti Gupta with a chart to stagger to the weekend. Well, we have to talk about President Biden going to Asia. One of the key reasons he's doing that is to really secure up and look into the issues that are in the supply chains. At the core of it, or at the crux of it, is those semiconductors. And that brings me to my chart of the day. We're looking at the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index, otherwise known as the SOX Index. We're keeping it simple here, Tom. A two-year chart that shows the powerful rally that you've seen in chip stocks. It goes higher, higher, higher. And a lot of that driven by this chip shortage, this nonstop demand, the ability to pass on more cost to consumers. But then if you look year to date, you do start to see a pullback. Now, some of this is going to be that macro risk off sentiment. The other part of it is simply how many of these companies aren't able to keep up in terms of capacity when it comes to chips and are also facing perhaps the fears of some of that demand destruction. Chips at the heart of uh, all of it as well. Pretty good to thank you uh, so much. This is a joy. Ben Emmons, is a managing director of global macro strategy at Medley Global Advisors, but he's actually the person I hate the most within the racket. The reason is he writes nicely long memos that are forced to be read. Lisa and I hate him with a passion, and we're thrilled he could join us this morning. The China note was mesmerizing, and at the bottom end of your note, it is shocking the rebound that you call for when and how big will be the rebound of China? Yeah, we think it's happening as we speak. So, so the Shanghai lockdown is easing in some parts. Um, but, you know, it's an infrastructure-led rebound. Um, now, you know, it, it may not lead what we saw in the U.S. of this really sharp, like, V-shape. But in China terms, it's obviously significant. You know, the way they shut down is nothing what we did. But it's a, like an All industrial right. shutdown. By mm -hmm. keeping, by the way, factories open for foreign companies. But at the end of the day, I think it's it's a it's a rebound that's you know meaningful, at least like say a relief to global markets. Of there's also another story than all the dismal uh, situations that we've seen this week. A global reopening. That's that China story. When I look at and, and the, the, my shock of the week, besides of course the inflation numbers out of Europe, was Newcastle, Australia coal, which is basically unmeasurable. It's such a moonshot. Is that one indicator of what's to come for an August China or a November China? Yeah, that's for sure. I think that China pent up quote unquote demand for commodities is a theme that may come back. You know, it's not something that has really abated from you know the the <clears throat> let's say the negative sentiment is overhanging right. the, the the equity markets of you no, know, there's a recession coming in the United States that should lower demand for commodities. Right. So. I think, I think uh, Lisa, at mid-year here, this is a massive, massive part of a jigsaw puzzle that no one has an answer to. And, you know, Ben is clearly polarized here with a huge rebound there. But the China mystery, to me, is the biggest of all mysteries. And how much does this bleed into possibly more persistent inflation versus some resolution to supply chains, Ben? How do you parse out a recovering China into the current moment where we're seeing somewhat of a slowdown on the peripheries, but also that inflationary push based on supply chain disruptions? Yeah, if you take, Lisa, the, uh, the supply chain index from the New York Fed, they just put that out a few days ago, and it showed there the contribution of China of, again, increasing the pressure on the supply chain globally. And that, I think, is lingering still here, even though the reopening of China is you know, upon us and you know, in the quarter or so that that will happen, that supply chain pressure is not easing. So you do have to factor this in inflation. You know, and to early discussion with other guests, people are trying to figure out how tight financial conditions have to be for our inflation rate to really start to roll down. I thought it was interesting that if you input the commodity analysis that we've done with energy aspects with my colleague Emery de Sen, you actually offset a lot as a result of tiny financial conditions, but an energy shock that's still very strong there, including the supply chain pressures that inflation is going to only very gradually moderate in the coming year, perhaps less even than what the Fed predicts. So, Ben, do you think that this actually calls for the Fed to actually get more aggressive than people think by the back end of the year, simply because you don't have any slowdown and that you actually get a reigniting of some of the momentum that's allowing inflation to be more persistent? I think that is the tone from the Federal Reserve that we're hearing. I thought that 
Paul again was quite resolute in the, the Wall Street Journal interview of being really committed to uh, sustain this tightening path. Unlike Evans, who came in and said, well, we could maybe moderate tightening over time. Most of the FOMC seem to be more around coming around what Powell thinks. We have to continue until we get meaningful decline in inflation, as he says, like consistent meaningful decline. Mm -hmm. And that's not where the state we're in. So, yes, the Fed could get to a second inning if, you know, by the end of the year of tightening for Lisa, that's baseball talk, second inning there. Thank you. It's I appreciate it. Football that's, talk. That's, that's great. Ben Ammons getting us back to America with the baseball talk. Thank you so much Thank with you. Medley Global Advisors. Lisa, we got to sum up here as we leave on a jet plane. Francine took the Gulf Stream back after the Ken Griffin uh, interview. You and I are going to stagger over there. And I, I'm absolutely fascinated by how this Davos confronts the new history that we're all confronting. Yeah, and how does it frankly regain uh, some sort of narrative over an issue that really is a big question mark right. to everyone, right? I mean, how do you deal with its inflation at a time where you have some people worrying uh, about just, you know, whether they want to go on that extra trip and other people worrying about whether they're going to have food to eat, Tom? I mean, honestly, it's, how do you parse yeah, out this exactly. differential? And as Robert Gates has said, and we heard this from General Kim as well, the holiday from history uh, is over. Lisa, safe travels uh, is, as well. is well over there. And uh, we've got a guest list. We're going to keep the guest list quiet, folks, because, you know, there's there's a lot of give and take and schedules and meetings and meet and grat that and all. We're trying to get Steve Gerard to come down after Aston Villa gets it done. I don't know if we're going to be able to pull that off. One of the big questions, I think, heading into this Davos is the new globalization or the new polarization uh, in different powers. I know you're you're like saying, wow, she just totally Farrell blew over that perhaps. Yeah, I mean, what did you expect? Did you think that I would engage? No, with the, no, I, mean, no I did not. And all I mean, next week, I don't think you're going to engage <laughs> no, as well. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Honestly, I just I think that there are some very big questions, aside from Premier League football, which I will give you ample time to talk about with all of our wonderful guests. There is an issue of how we deal with supply chains in a new reality at a time when there are new poles of power. And this, I think, is really underpinning a lot of people's view and more sticky, right. persistent inflation. Well, this goes back to Angela Stent in my book of the year, folks, Putin's World, and she does not predict this, but she brings up the idea, Lisa, here of a return to Yalta, of an America, of a Russia of China and really a re, re a rejiggering of things, which goes to Bloomberg and the president perhaps visiting with the royalty of Saudi Arabia. And honestly, we're coming off those retail sales that throws this into hard numbers, right? At this point, it's a margin story for a lot of companies yeah. that are dealing with the higher inflation, the supply chain disruptions. At what point does it continue to go to an inflation story versus a stagflationary well, the, type yeah, of environment? Yeah, the inflation story to me is a huge deal. We underplayed Europe inflation uh, this week, which is really uh, shocking as well. We are steeled for a weekend of travel, and we will join you Mon I, Monday, is it, Lisa? Right now? It's Monday? Oh, I thought you were asking Monday. if it's, it's Friday Davos. right now. Good morning. <laughs> yes, Monday we'll be there.